All right, so let's dive right into it. Actually, let, let me say a few things. So um, I tried to make sure to leave ample time for questions and discussion. So, so I, I, the number of slides is not going to fill up four hours, God forbid. So I hope that you guys will interrupt me a lot. And um, we can leave a, a, a block of time at the end of each half of this tutorial um, to, to just have an open discussion about the topics. Um, and I'm sure that there are people in here that uh, know about some of the topics that I'm going to cover better than I do. And so I have no ego. You can uh, interrupt me and tell me that I'm wrong. Um, uh, so I'm going to try to cover a, a, quite a broad scope of uh, approximate inference ideas. And um, really, in, in some ways, I'll go, uh, in some parts, I'll go into more depth. But some parts, I'm going to cover more superficially, just to give you kind of a bird's eye view of what the different possibilities are. All right. So here's the roadmap. Um, I'm going to start with some basic principles of uh, probability theory just to get everybody up to speed. Um, probably a lot of you are already familiar with that. Then I'll, I'll quickly raise the question, are people Bayesian at all? So, so to broach the question of approximate inference in the brain, we have to ask, is there any inference at all uh, um, to a first approximation? And then I'll talk about how there are some uh, documented successes of Bayesian models of cognition, actually quite a few. But on the other hand, there are many documented failures. And one of the goals of this tutorial is to explain how some of those documented failures could be explained as a consequence of approximate inference algorithms. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two broad families of approximate inference algorithms. Um, in this first half, I'll talk about Monte Carlo algorithms. And then in the second half of the, tutor the tutorial, I'll talk, talk about um, variational methods. And those are most familiar to neuroscientists in the form of uh, free energy uh, methods or principles that's, that, uh, algorithms that stem from the free energy principle. Um, and then I'm going to talk about an extension or kind of a generalization of variational methods uh, to the setting of what's called amortized inference. Um, and I'll explain what that means. But basically, it's the idea that um, you can learn a, a parameterized mapping from your data to your approximate posterior. Um, and that allows um, this parameterized mapping to basically learn how to infer. So it's a kind of meta-learning for approximate inference. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about this question, are we making things too complicated? Basically, you'll see that in order to uh, execute a, uh, an approximate inference algorithm in a, in a principled way in a neural circuit, things have to be set up in a very specific way, right? So you, you have to um, organize, you have to structure this neural circuit in a way that you can guarantee that it's actually implementing the specific mathematical operations you need to do these specific approximate um, uh, inference algorithms. But maybe that's making things too complicated and we're putting too, mu too many demands on the brain. Maybe it's actually a lot simpler. You could take generic neural networks and you could specify conditions under which those generic neural networks will, appro will approximate correct inference. Um, uh, and so approximate inference then ar arises emergently from some more fundamental principles. And we can talk about that. All right. So basic probability. Um, th the main thing that the, the, the main two rules of probability that you need to know are the product rule and the sum rule. Um, these are operations on, on joint probability distribution. So uh, the product rule says that you can factorize a joint distribution over two variables, let's call them A and B, into the product of the conditional distribution and the marginal distribution. Um, and one reason this factorization is useful is because um, I, li I like to think about it in terms of a kind of a causal story. So um, one way to, to generate samples uh, from this joint distribution is to first sample from one of the marginals and then sample from the conditional distribution. So it gives you a kind of recipe for sequentially sampling from the random variables uh, to produce a sample from the joint distribution. Um, then uh, the, the other important rule is the sum rule, which tells you how to take the joint distribution and convert it into a marginal, uh, basically by summing over the variables that you want to marginalize over. Um, and I'll mostly be talking about dis discrete variables uh, just because it's easier to communicate. Um, but if we're talking about continuous variables, you can just replace the summation signs with integrals. Um, so most of what you need to know about probability, most of what you need to know about what I'm going to talk about today comes from these principles. Uh, so let's just give a concrete example. Let's imagine a joint distribution over um, two binary variables, rain or no rain, and wet and not wet. Uh, so as you might expect, you're more likely to get wet when it rains. But it's also possible to get wet when it doesn't rain. Um, 
And, um, and it's also possible to not get wet when it rains. Um, so if we wanted to know the joint distribution over getting wet and, rain it, and it raining, you could factorize it into the pro probability of it raining and the conditional probability of it being wet given that um, there's rain. So that's what I mean by a causal story, that you can, you can factorize these joint distributions in a way that makes sense causally. Of course, you can factorize it the other way around, too. You can, you can factorize it into the, probability, the marginal probability of getting wet times the conditional probability of rain given wet, and that might be less causally intuitive for people, even though mathematically it's equivalent. Um, and then you can also calculate the marginal probability of uh, getting wet, which is um, just the probability of getting wet given um, it rain times the probability of, get, of it raining plus the probability of wet given no rain times the probability of no rain. So it, it's just basically summing over uh, all the different ways that you could get wet. Okay. Any questions so far? This is all pretty elementary. Um, now, we can basically use those two rules. And put, when you put them together, you get Bayes' rule, and that's really going to be the central th topic of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I've, I've relabeled the variables S and D to denote S being some latent variable, some state of the world, if you will, and D being your, your data. So we can ask, what is the conditional distribution, the posterior probability of the hidden state of the world given the data you've observed? And Bayes' rule says that that's going to be equal to the product of the likelihood of the data under a hypothetical state times the prior probability of that state. And then um, in the denominator, there's this normalizing constant. OK, so that's the posterior probability of hypothesis-given data. Um, and we're going to come back to why computing this is hard in practice and why you need approximations. Um, but before we get there, let's just talk for a minute theoretically about why an idealized agent should be Bayesian at all. Um, there are a bunch of classical arguments about why you should be Bayesian. Um, and we're, I'm not going to go into any of these in detail, but just so you're aware of them. So one argument uh, is um, uh, called the Dutch book argument. And, it, and essentially what it says is that if you disobey the probability axioms, if, which entail that you're not going to be Bayesian, um, then someone else can exploit you uh, for their own gain. They can basically turn you into a money pump. Um, uh, there's another decision theoretic motivation for Bayes' rule that's called the complete class theorems that I show below. Um, and roughly speaking, this says that um, if you think about admissible decision rules, these are decision rules that aren't dominated by some other rule. Um, basically, almost all of the decision rules you would think of are, are Bayesian. There, there are some classes of, decision rule, of admissible decision rules that aren't Bayesian, but for, for, um, as a first pass, um, we, can, we can make that statement. Um, so that, what that says is that if you want a good decision rule, you should, be Bayesian, you should use Bayesian decision theory. Um, and then there's another motivation that's based on a generalization of logic to probability, and that's um, um, known as Cox's theorem. Um, and the, the basic idea here is that if we assign um, scalar plausibilities to hypotheses that set, uh, satisfy a set of intuitive axioms, so basically they're real valued and consistent with Boolean algebra, then it turns out that the plausibilities have to be isomorphic to to probabilities. So we can derive these um, real valued numbers that quantify the plausibility of some um, statement in Boolean logic. Um, and that it turns out that, that if we want them to satisfy the intuitive axioms uh, of logic, then uh, they have to be isomorphic to probability. And if you want to learn more about any of these arguments, uh, I highly recommend this book by E.T. James called Probability Theory, the Logic of Science. Um, but none of these arguments are going to be important for what I want to talk about today. All right, so now let's talk uh, about the empirical side, which is, are people Bayesian? Um, some of you may be familiar with this famous paper from um, Tom Griffiths and Josh Tenenbaum, uh, where they asked people to make predictions about everyday um, temporal events, like, uh, suppose that I told you that some cake has been baking for 20 minutes, what do you think is the total time that it has to be baked for? Uh, and they did this for a whole bunch of different things, like lengths of poems, movie grosses, movie run times. Um, some of these are debatable to what extent they're actually intuitive, like pharaohs. But um, the, the point here is that um, they could use the um, uh, they could use ecological data on the prior probabilities and combine that with um, uh, a likelihood function, um, which they derived from first principles, and and show that basically people's uh, people's judgments about the, um, these 
forecasts are basically very closely, uh, they very closely align with uh, Bayes' optimal predictions. Um, and that motivated many other studies to look at um, Bayesian prediction, uh, sorry, um, psychological prediction from a Bayesian perspective. And you'll see many studies with titles like this, like motion illusions as optimal percepts, um, you know, a rational analysis of the selection task as optimal data selection. Um, there, there's a huge number of studies that have the word optimal in their title, and they're referring to, uh, to um, applications of Bayesian inference to cognition, going from visual perception all the way up to high-level cognition. Um, but at the same time, I'm sure many of you are aware that there's another perspective, which says that uh, people are really bad at all sorts of things, including Bayes' rule, um, that they violate the principles of uh, decision theory and, and probability theory in many different ways. Uh, and that's led to the view that uh, people aren't actually following the rules of probability. What they're doing is using a bunch of heuristics um, that can serve them well under certain circumstances, but can also lead them systematically astray. Um, so that's try that, the kind of the hardcore version of that argument is that we shouldn't even try to match people to the Bayesian norm because they're, they're, they're doing something fundamentally different at a psychological level. So what I'm going to talk about today is motivated by the challenge. Can we bridge this gap without throwing out the whole apparatus of uh, Bayesian inference, um, uh, but still trying to explain why people screw up in some systematic ways. Um, and the, the basic argument here is that one reason why people may look Bayesian uh, in aggregate, um, but still make systematic errors, is that uh, basically you can't be Bayesian. You can't be a perfect Bayesian for uh, even moderately large problems, because the computational complexity is too large. Um, so you have to make approximations, and classically, if you look at papers on Bayesian inference in psychology, they kind of swept that part under the rug. They say, like, all right, here's this generative model, and here's the posterior, and then we do, you know, MCMC, blah, blah, blah. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, it doesn't matter, um, because any possible algorithm for approximating the posterior will give the same answer. Um, but that, that's, that's never going to explain the deviations from Bayes' rule um, if you, if you um, run the computational algorithms that, that, basically clo that closely approximate the true posterior. Um, what we want to do here is ask whether we can explain deviations from uh, Bayesian inference in terms of the approximations that people use. And so we'll look at a bunch of different possible ex uh, approximations and think about the specific deviations that those predict. Uh, and as we'll see, and hopefully maybe we can discuss this, um, Sometimes it's not entirely straightforward what predictions to make. Uh, and, and also, there's this other scary possibility that the space of approximations is so vast, um, there, there's not a clear way to, to discipline it. All right. Um, and then throughout this tutorial, I'm going to talk about ways in which we can ground these algorithms in biologically plausible neural circuits. And for some of these algorithms, those ideas are, are better developed than others. Um, OK. Uh, so I've already said that people need to use approximations because of computational intractability. Um, so what exactly are people optimizing? How do they choose a, a good approximation? Or if they choose a particular family of approximation, how do they choose um, the precision with which they approximate the posterior? Um, and that leads us uh, to an important concept that's sometimes called computational rationality or resource rationality. Um, and the idea is that. Um, uh, that because of finite cognitive resources, you're going to choose an approximation algorithm that balances the cost of executing that approximate inference algorithm and the benefits of a higher precision, for example, by running it longer or with more samples or, or however we choose to parameterize that. Um, and, and this leads to the idea that um, although you can p possibly arbitrarily improve your performance with longer run times, um, finite run times are going to be optimal given some cost on computation time. That could be an opportunity cost or an energetic cost. And that's di um, diagrammed here. This is a diagram that Eric Horvitz made. Um, so the idea here is that uh, uh, the value of the, resu the result in some cost-free world is increasing probably monotonically. Um, but the cost of delaying your action to run the computation is also increasing probably monotonically. Uh, and so the net value of action is going to be non-monotonic. Um, so that gives you kind of an intuition for why you'd want to use um, approximation algorithms. And we'll come back to um, this framework for trying to make some specific predictions about um, 
uh, about particular experimental paradigms. Okay. Um, so a lot has been said about representation and manipulation of probabilities in the brain. And I'm not going to go exhaustively through all of that. Um, what I want to do is focus on uh, neural inference implementations that um, are scalable uh, in the sense that uh, they can be applied to very large, potentially very large problems. Um, and I'll talk in a moment about some classical ideas about inference in the brain which don't appear to be scalable. Um, or they might be scalable, but you have to make some more elaborate assumptions. So for example, um, probabilistic population codes is probably one of the best known ideas about um, representation of probability distributions in the brain. Um, but it, it, is, it can, at least in its classical implementation, it, it runs into scalability issues. OK, so here's what a probabilistic population code looks like. Um, the basic idea is, is quite simple. So um, there's some stimulus um, that's generated by the world. Um, and then that stimulus uh, gets translated by the brain into some pattern of spikes. That's represented by R. Uh, so there's some spike generating process. That could be uh, a, uh, some Poisson distribution de uh, defined over um, some set of tuning curves. Uh, that, so I'm showing you an example here for orientation where you have a bunch of these bell-shaped, um, um, th these orientation-tuned neurons. And then each of those neurons is going to generate spikes according to some Poisson process. Um, and then a downstream decoder can look at those spikes and try to read out what the, um, the orientation value is um, uh, uh, as encoded by that um, set of spikes. Um, and, uh, and an important idea in probabilistic population codes is that the gain of this population code is directly related to the um, variance of the, uh, of the posterior. So, when the gain is lower, uh, which is shown on the bottom there, so that this hill of activity get, uh, is uh, pushed down, um, then the decoded variable is going to be have a broader distribution. So you'll have, in, in essence, you'll have more uncertainty about that variable. Um, and they argued that this was possible because uh, variables like contrast, which we know affect uncertainty, uh, affect population codes, at least in visual cortex, in this way. Um, now, it's important to keep in mind here that we're talking about decoding a single scalar variable. Right? Um, what do we do when we want to encode lots of different things? How do we, um, how do we encode them and how do we decode them? Um, and in general, the number of parameters that we would re require to specify a multivariate distribution is going to scale exponentially with the number of its variables. Um, so we would need a, a vast number of neurons uh, to explain even a margin, uh, modestly large a modestly high dimensional um, distribution. And th so that, that suggests that this particular implementation would not be scalable. Um, and th there's also so other constraints when you want to use um, uh, probabilistic population codes depending on how um, you want to do decoding. Uh, there are constraints on the characteristics of neural tuning curves and noise. Um, so I think it's still debatable to what extent you can use probabilistic population codes to um, do scalable inference. but at least this suggests that, naively implemented, they're not going to be scalable. OK. Um, are there any questions so far? OK. So now we'll, we'll jump into approximate inference. Um, so I'm going to start with Monte Carlo methods, because I think they're, they're quite easy to understand, um, even if the process by which the um, samples themselves are generated could be rather complicated. Um, OK. So the, the basic idea is the following. Suppose that I have, um, suppose I'm able to generate a bunch of samples from, my, th from the distribution of interest, the posterior. Um, and that's what I'm showing you over there. So the S sub K, the K indexes uh, the samples that are generated from this distribution. So now I can approximate that distribution um, uh, basically, by putting a delta function on each of those samples, that's what that, that indicator i um, variable denotes, um, and taking uh, and, and basically um, uh, just placing uh, placing a delta function at each of the samples, and that's going to give me a discrete approximation of this distribution. And in general, I'll denote the approximate distributions by q. Okay, uh, and so we can contrast this kind of sampling-based representation, which is fundamentally discrete with parametric representations, which might try to represent the distribution with um, 
uh, a set of parameters like of Gaussian with some mean invariance. And that'll be relevant when we come back to thinking about variational methods. Um, so the basic idea is very simple. I'm going it'll, to, it'll get a little bit more complicated as we go along and start to think about how the samples are generated. But for now, we can already start to say some things about uh, applying this model to cognition. So for example, uh, one motivation for thinking about sampling-based methods is to understand behavioral variability. Um, why do people seem to be random to some extent in their behaviors, uh, for example, in their decisions? Well, Monte Carlo methods provide one answer, which is that um, if you're taking a small number of samples, um, your posterior distribution now is going to be a random variable. Um, and, and so the randomness in your sampler is going to induce randomness in your, de in your decision behavior. Um, so um, uh, imagine, for example, that the decision theoretically optimal th um, action is to select the, the stimulus that is the highest pro has the highest probability under the posterior. So this is something called the maximum a posteriori, or MAP estimate. Okay? Um, now, I don't have direct access to the true posterior. I only have access to this approximation, approximate posterior, Q. So I'm going to run the sample or generate Q and then s select S greedily th that maxes um, Q, maximizes Q. Um, um, so you can unpack Q to get this expression at the bottom. Now, uh, in the limit, if you only took a single sample, your decisions are going to be exactly probability matching the posterior. In other words, you're going to choose stimulus S in, um, with probability equal to the, uh, pro its probability under the posterior distribution. So that's called posterior probability matching. Um, and as you get more samples, you're going to get closer and closer to true maximization. Uh, and then somewhere in between, for a small number of samples, um, you're going to uh, you're going to look sort of like you're doing quasi probability matching. So why do we think that people are uh, only taking a small number of samples? Well, this comes back to computational rationality. Oh no, Wagey's here, so he's, <laughs> he's going to tell me he's going to tell me the way it's supposed to be. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So why why only take a small number of samples? Um, the uh, so, the, so let's go back to computational rationality. There's a cost of time, um, and there's the benefit of increasing the number of samples. Um, so what, what we need to do is combine these two sources of information to, to calculate the expected utility per unit time. And depending on, upon the, the relative costs and benefits of samples, you're going to get this uh, function that's non-monotonic. So the optimal number of samples to take could be quite small. Um, and this was worked out in, in great detail by Ed Vool in this paper. Um, which is very interesting, but also, I think, somewhat arbitrary because it, it doesn't really give us a recipe for pinning down exactly what the costs and benefits of sampling are. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the issues that's always bothered me in thinking about these algorithms um, in the brain is because we, we don't know exactly what the costs of sampling are. Um, and so we can draw these curves, but um, they're somewhat disconnected from reality. Um, but but we, can we can still make a kind of general argument about um, why we would want to use a small number of samples because, um, because a large number of samples are going to be too costly. Okay? Um, and you see this phenomenon of probability matching uh, in many different domains. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, so this goes back actually to the early days of, of signal detection theory. Um, so this study by Tanner, Sweats, and Green um, they changed the prior probability of the signal uh, to at different levels, and then they looked at people's um, uh, looked at the probability of an individual reporting a signal present, um, and they found that it increases linearly with um, the base rate of the signal. Um, so that that is not really compatible with kind of the the um, signal detection theory under perfect inference, unless you posit some noise that's scaling with your um, posterior uncertainty, and um, and Th this kind of um, sampling-based approximation of the posterior could give one route to producing that kind of posterior probability matching behavior. Um, so these are, uh, these are low-level like, auditory signal detection tasks, but you also see this in high-level tasks. So this was a um, study by Noah Goodman and colleagues where they were looking at uh, Boolean concept learning. Uh, and I won't go into the details of that study, but suffice it to say that they developed this Bayesian model that fit people's behavior pretty well. But one of the interesting observations that they made um, was that uh, that um, the the probability of observing a particular report um, in their group of subjects scaled with the posterior probability of that of that hypothesis? 
Um, so people look Bayesian on aggregate, um, but it's but the question is why do people look why do people um, show this linear relationship between um, posterior probability under the model and the probability of generating an answer if they were being um, if they were being decision theoretically optimal they should just report the um, hypothesis with highest probability and you see this also in other tasks. Um, um, so Ed Vol and colleagues reanalyzed data from that optimal predictions uh, paper that I showed you before and showed that basically the same story arises that on aggregate people look Bayesian, um, but it doesn't seem to be consistent with the um, decision theoretically optimal uh, policy under um, perfect, um, uh, perfect inference. Um, you also see this in children. So this is an experiment that Stephanie Dennison uh, and Alison Gopnik's lab did where um, they, they were looking at causal inference in children. They had this machine where you could put blocks into the machine and it would make some sound. Um, they had different colored blocks, um, red and blue blocks. And what they manipulated were the proportion of red and blue blocks um, in these buckets. And they were looking at, at children's inferences about which of the blocks they thought uh, was responsible for producing the sound that the machine uh, produced. Um, and they again found this phenomenon that people that, that children probability match. So their um, the probability that children reported a particular um, color is was scaling roughly linearly with the probability of that of that block or chip. Um, now, so far I've been talking about the number of samples as kind of uh, a static object in the sense that we pick some number of samples and. Um, and, uh, and generate a response by drawing that number of samples. But it could also be the case that the uh, number of samples is adaptively selected. Um, and this was something that was studied by Jess Hamrick. It's a little bit blurry, sorry. Um, so they were looking at physical predictions. Um, so they, they, would show, uh, they would show subjects this trajectory of a ball uh, that's bouncing around a, um, a frame, and it was following Newtonian mechanics. Um, and they, were, they would ask uh, their subjects whether or not they thought that it would go into some particular uh, target area. Uh, and they looked at uh, people's answers as a function of how many bounces um, that ball made. Um, or sorry, how many bounces that ball was going to make prospectively. So they, so they wouldn't show the complete trajectory. They would show part of the trajectory. And then so, so the idea was that subjects would have to simulate the rest of the trajectory to make a prediction. Um, and uh, they used, uh, Hamrick and colleagues calculated um, the optimal number of samples uh, to take um, under, some, uh, under some linear cost model for, uh, for sampling. And what they found was that um, it predicted this pattern where uh, um, the more uncertain you are, the more samples you should take. And that was consistent with, with subjects' responses. So people seemed to take a longer, uh, have a longer response time to, um, when, they were, uh, when they were making predictions when there were more bounces. Uh, under, and um, this comes out of the model because when there are more bounces, there's going to be a higher level of uncertainty. Um, they're, they're assuming here that when there's a bounce, there's going to be an increased level of noise. Um, so this was an interesting way of using response times to make inferences about the number of samples that people are taking. OK. Um, I'm going to move on to discussions of sampling in the brain. But before I do that, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. This one. Yeah, I mean, well, it depends on their utility function, but, but yeah, you, you would expect, you, you'd basically be looking for a step function if everybody had the same priors and the same utility function. So this should look something like and then, and that there is no noise, basically, in their, in their decision process. Yeah. So, so one hypothesis here, we don't know exactly, but one hypothesis is that the noise is coming from a sampling process, that they're, they're doing some kind of sam sampling from the posterior. There are other sources of noise too, right? So you can have noise, you could have an exact posterior, but you have extra noise in your decision process, or you could have extra noise in, at, the, at the level of um, perception as well. Um, and, and in some sense, I'd imagine that 
we need to take into account all those sources of noise. Um, actually, so Jan Drugovich did, uh, has a very nice paper where he looked at this and he made the argument that um, most of the noise that accounts for uh, suboptimality in perceptual decision tasks comes from computational noise as opposed to sensory noise. So that he tried to exactly quantify what the, the specific contributions of the noise are. Other questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so I, I should have explained that in a little bit more detail. So the model that they use to make these predictions is called the noisy Newtonian model. Uh, and the idea here is that the, the, the trajectory of the ball is just following regular Newtonian mechanics. But uh, in addition, there's, there's, some noise that get, um, there's some noise that's added uh, when the, the ball um, hits other objects. Um, Yeah, well, the question is, what is it that's making it harder? How do you model the hardness? And so one way to do that, basically, is to assume that there's more uncertainty when there's bounces. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, it depends on exactly what the... the so, so basically... If the, if the posterior probability of some chip um, being the correct cause is greater than 50%, if we're talking about two alternative force choice, then it should be a, it should be a step function, right? Because the map estimate is going to be a deterministic mapping from the, um, from the posterior to the decision. And so this yeah. Well, I haven't gotten to the specific, I, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, the specific ways that you might generate samples. I, right now, I'm making the naive assumption that you could just generate samples from the posterior, and the interesting variable here is how many samples you, you generate. So if you generate a small number of samples, then you're, it's, you're going to produce um, uh, matching behavior. Right? Uh, and we'll, but we'll get into more specific predictions of particular sample generating algorithms. Um, th well, th there are different sources of noise, right? So, so you could have noise in perception. There, it's also totally possible that you have, um, that, that things look like noise, but that's because of model misspecification. So um, uh, Zach Pitko and Weiji have this paper on, called Not Noisy, Just Wrong, in which they draw out the implications of that idea. Um, so we have, to, we have to be very careful about parsing these different sources of noise. That's what makes it so, so hard, right? So it's possible that people are doing exact inference but with the wrong model, and that could appear to us, the experimenters, as looking like some, something like probability matching, possibly, depending on what the model specification is. Right. Right. But if you're doing, if you're doing noisy, well, th this is now, so if you're doing, for example, noisy rollouts, if your policy is, has a stochastic element, for example, then, then your rollouts will be noisy and your val your, your, the resulting value function is going to be noisy, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, well, the, the last question was about um, planning, which I haven't really talked about, but the idea that uh, that you could have determinate you the question was would you have um, this kind of probability matching if you had deterministic planning is that right okay or something like that yeah um, but I was talking I, my response was that that many modern planets have some stochastic many modern planners have some stochastic element and that that might produce probability matching but but in that regime we're not actually talking about inference anymore we're talking about um, we're talking about planning Okay. Um, so another reason why sampling algorithms have been interesting uh, is because they, they seem to, uh, they, they, for the same reason that they can explain behavioral variability, they maybe hold the promise of explaining neural variability. So we know that neurons are highly variable, 
Um, and um, maybe that variability is just kind of an endogenous property of those um, of the spike generating process, but maybe it serves some functional purpose. Um, and that's, that's really the line of argument that neural sampling theories uh, try to articulate. So in the simplest version of such uh, theories, each neuron represents a particular random variable, and sampling represents a sample from that distribu a distribution over that random variable. Um, and then you have to set up the neural circuit in such a way that it that it collectively samples from the correct joint distribution over these variables. Right? Um, uh, so, oh, and I'll get into some specific instantiations of that in a minute. But before, but but it might be useful first to just try to think about what happens when you have neural sampling, assuming that we can perfectly generate samples from the posterior distribution. Um, uh, so I'm going to be referring to um, right in this first part to some analyses that were done. Uh, by Orban and colleagues to, to examine this hypothesis. Now, in order to do this, you have to start by postulating some internal model, some probabilistic model. Uh, and what they did was they were looking at V1 neurons, and they, they posited a simple um, linear Gaussian model um, for image patches, where each Im image patch um, was generated by some uh, linear combination of basis functions multiplied by uh, a contrast, a global contrast variable, and then corrupted by Gaussian noise. And so that's schematized on the left here, where you, you're going to take a little uh, patch of this image, and you have these uh, gabors that represent the basis functions, and then you have different levels of activation for each of those basis functions. And so the inference problem is now to infer the posterior probability um, over the activations um, of those basis functions given the, the sensory input, which is the image, the image patch, rather. Um, so this is a very simple model, but you already can use it to make a bunch of interesting predictions. So one argument that they made, uh, and this is similar to the arguments that have been made about behavioral variability, is that if you have higher uncertainty, you're going to have higher variability. Um, and they showed this by, by um, looking at um, the, the Fano factor, which is the standard deviation over the mean, um, for low contrast and high contrast images. Um, and what this shows is that the variance, the final factor is higher under low contrast than high contrast. And that's consistent with this idea that if you have more uncertainty, your uh, sampler is going to have, uh, the samples that are generated by, by your sampler are going to be more variable. Um, and, and so you're going to have a higher final factor. Um, a, a, another corollary of this is that stimulus onset should quench neural variability. Um, and that is true. So if you compare spontaneous um, activity to evoked activities, so evoked in response to some image, um, you typically see higher variability for spontaneous activity compared to evoked activity. Um, and this fo follows from the fact that um, when you don't see any image at all, you're going to have the highest uncertainty, uh, and so you're going to have the highest variability. Um, you can actually go one step further uh, than this, and you can um, you, uh, and th they reason that actually the spontaneous activity should match the average evoked activity for natural images. Um, and the reason this is true is if, you th is if we go back to the sum rule, the, the marginal probability uh, of the activations is going to be the sum of all the conditional probability of, the, of these activations, um, uh, conditional on the image, uh, multiplied by the prior probability of the image. Um, and if you, think that the, if you think that the images that they're showing um, in these experiments are drawn from the distribution of natural images, then, then this relationship between the marginal probability of the activations um, and the conditional probability of the activation should hold. But if you take some other distribution, like if you just show images of gratings, which aren't drawn from the natural image distribution, then that relationship will no longer hold. So the way that they went about uh, analyzing this is by using a divergence measure, the, the kolbach leibler divergence. And this is actually something that's going to come back when we talk about variational inference. Um, but right now, this is just a data analysis tool. So they're, they're computing the divergence between um, the spontaneous, um, di the distribution of spontaneous activity and the distribution of evoked activity for either, um, sorry, the average, the, 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 the marginal distribution of, of evoked activity. Um, for either gratings or natural images. And what they find is that um, the, the divergence is much larger when you um, 
look at the, the non-natural images compared to the natural images, and that's consistent with the, the claim that um, the divergence should be smaller, in principle, actually zero, um, if you're looking at uh, samples from the, if, if you're looking at measurements from this um, uh, evoke distribution for natural images. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right, feel free to interrupt me as I go. Okay. Um, so we can also um, look at implications for perceptual decision making. This is work that Ralph Hefner did. So we're again gonna use a simple um, generative model for, um, for uh, V1 activity, V1 neurons. Um, but here we're also gonna add this um, decision variable that's generated conditional on the V1 activities. Um, and the, the reasoning here is that if you have variability in your beliefs, that's gonna produce variability in your choice behavior. Um, and there should be a particular structure in the relationship between these two things, uh, and that's shown here. Um, so th they were interested in looking specifically at noise correlations. So the, this is the case where um, no stimulus is present, but you can measure the trial by trial correlations between, um, between neurons with different preferred orientations on these um, no stimulus trials. Um, and what they find uh, is that neurons with similar preferred orientations show some correlation of activity, um, and it also depends on whether those, those um, orientations lead to the same decision or a different decision, right? So, um, so these two things will obviously be related, um, but essentially you, you put a decision boundary in this orientation space, and now um, neurons that are on either side of this decision boundary, they'll, they'll basically um, covary together more strongly than across that decision boundary. Um, and they'll do that in a way that's parametrically dependent on the, the difference in their preferred orientation. Um, and so the, the reasoning here is that, the, um, that you get these noise correlations because, um, um, because, you're, because of the sampling process that, that um, when you observe an image, you're going to get uh, draws from this belief distribution um, and the, the hypothetical orientation, the similar or, neurons that prefer similar orientations are gonna tend to be coactive because they um, have similar probability under the posterior. All right. Um, so let's come to the question now of generating samples. Uh, so I've so far assumed naively that we could just somehow magically generate samples from the posterior, but that's actually the hard part. How do we get samples from the posterior if the posterior is itself intractable? Um, and I'm gonna talk about two broad approaches to solving this problem. One is Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, and the other is important sampling and its dynamical variant, which is called particle filtering. Um, so uh, the basic idea of, of MCMC is that we can, even though we can't directly sample from the posterior, we can sample from some dynamical system whose equilibrium distribution is the posterior. Um, so that's schematized here. We, we're gonna set up a Markov chain that's parameterized by some transition distribution um, over, the, over, the stim, uh, over the hidden state or stimulus. Um, and what makes it Markovian is because it only depends on the last sample that was drawn uh, from that distribution. Um, and if you set this up right, then you can guarantee that this chain is eventually gonna converge to an equilibrium where samples are drawn from the target distribution. Um, and it turns out actually it's, there, there are pretty straightforward ways to set up chains with this property. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment, but for now, I just want to highlight two um, kind of conceptual properties of MCMC. So one is that, in general, MCMC is, is going to be autocorrelated. For most implementations of MCMC, there's going to be autocorrelation. And we're going to try to draw out some of the implications of that autocorrelation. Uh, so samples are going to tend to be similar if they're generated at similar points in time. And then the other is ergodicity. So asymptotically, if you run this long enough, it's going to be independent of your starting point. So initialization doesn't really matter. Um, however, um, again, if we return to this computational rationality idea that um, we're only drawing a, a limited number of samples, um, because of autocorrelation, you're going to uh, show dependence on the starting point. And that's going to have some important implications that we'll talk about. Um, so the, the classic MCMC algorithm is called the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. Um, and, the, and the way it works is as follows. So um, 
Again, I'm using k to index samples, but now k, k is basically uh, indexing time, um, um, a temporal sequence of draws from this Markov chain. Um, so what we're going to do is, at, at time k, we're going to sample from some proposed new state, s prime, from this distribution phi. And phi can basically be anything, um, but there are some practical constraints on how we specify phi. Um, and then we're going to accept or reject the, um, this proposal based on this, this acceptance rule. So um, if the proposal, uh, or actually, let, let me back up for a second. So if we look at, at this ratio, we're comparing um, the joint probability of this new sample um, compared to the joint probability of the old sample. Um, and then we're multiplying it by, um, oh, sorry, this should be, this should be a conditional distribution uh, in, that, in that ratio. So we want to look at, we have to compensate for the fact that it was drawn from some, from some, um, from this proposal distribution. And it, in the, the simplest case, if that proposal distribution is symmetric, then those phi terms cancel out, and we're just doing a, a ratio comparison of the joint distribution for the proposed sample relative to the, um, to, to the previous sample. Um, so if, that, if the proposed sample increases the joint probability, then you're going to accept it deterministically. But you could also accept it with some probability if it decreases the joint probability. So it has this flavor of stochastically exploring um, the posterior and, and sometimes transitioning to, to states that have lower probability. Um, now, Gibbs sampling is a special case of Metropolis-Hastings where the proposal distribution is the conditional distribution. So I'm going to pick one of the variables. Uh, and this applies to the case where the state is multidimensional. So I'm going to pick one of the, one of the variables in the state, condition on all the others, and um, sample from that um, conditional distribution. And it turns out that when you, when you do that, all the proposals are going to be accepted. And you can, there are different variations of this. So you can do, for example, blocked Gibbs where you sample from a bunch of these variables at the same time, conditioning on all the others. Um, OK. So that's kind of a, a very quick overview of, of MCMC, um, broadly speaking, and some specific implementations of MCMC. Now I want to talk about uh, applications to um, uh, perception and cognition. The place, I think, where this has been most successful uh, is in understanding perceptual multistability. Because that, that's an instance where there's very clear stochasticity in, in um, uh, the perceptual phenomenology. And it seems seductive to think that that might arise from um, variability in the sampling process. And, we'll, and it's particularly important to use these kinds of dynamical sampling algorithms to explain the dynamics uh, of the perceptual phenomenology. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, to create multistable percepts. I'm going to focus on binocular rivalry. That's where you show two different images um, to the eyes. And, and in general, what people experience is seeing one of the images dominant, dominant at a particular time, and then there's uh, stochastic switches between the, the dominant images. Um, so a number of years ago, we developed a a sampling-based model of perceptual multistability, particularly in application to um, binocular rivalry. Um, and, the, and the basic idea was um, not too dissimilar from the, the image models that I showed you before. So we're going to posit that there's some, um, there are these two images, one for each eye. Um, but the brain is trying to infer the true latent image that generated the, um, the, image, the, the sensory inputs. It also has this outlier process that basically allows it to determine whether particular pixels are corrupted so that they're giving incorrect input. So it can kind of ignore the sensory input in those, um, at those locations in the visual field. And the way that we model perceptual switches is we set some threshold on the number of node switches um, that, that would determine that a, a, um, a subject, that, that a particular stimulus is dominant. So the idea is that the sampling process is operating at the level of, of pixels, so one node per pixel. Um, but the, the subject's report is going to depend on some conglomeration of those nodes um, being consistent with each other. Um, this is a somewhat arbitrary assumption. Um, but, but as we'll see in a second, th there's some interesting implications when you actually look at the, the individual nodes themselves. Um, so I'm showing you here on the top right the, um, the an example dynamics of this model. Um, the, the critical 
explanatory power of this model comes from the fact that the posterior is going to be multimodal for these uh, um, when the binocular images are different. And so the uh, distribution is going to migrate from one mode to the next to the other and back and forth um, forever. And at equilibrium, it should be exhibiting that behavior. Um, the, one of the classic ways that people have quanti quantified binocular rivalry is looking at the distribution of dominance durations. And people have spent a lot of time arguing about whether this distribution is you know, gamma distributed or log normal distributed. You can, you can sort of, to a first approximation, capture some of those um, um, quantitatively with this model, but I think that's kind of the least interesting aspect of uh, binocular rivalry. Um, there's much more interesting aspects of binocular rivalry when you, when you look at some of the um, um, uh, other dynamical phenomena that come out of that. So one really interesting phenomenon is called traveling waves. Um, these were uh, experiments where um, what they did was they, they showed these, these gratings, uh, to, different gratings to the um, uh, two eyes, and the gratings were organized in an annulus. Um, so at, at any given time, your eye only saw one of those gratings, uh, sorry, your perception, you, you perceived only one of those gratings. Um, but what they did was they would transiently increase the contrast of the grating um, that was currently not dominant. And what that, the effect that had was kind of like lighting a fuse. So you, you would see um, that, that contrast enhanced part of the grating would now become dominant. And then it would start to travel around the annulus um, and, and make the whole, um, the whole annulus do, uh, dominant that wasn't dominant before. But, but there would be this sequential structure. And you could reveal that by measuring uh, people's judgments about what was the dominant percept at particular locations on the annulus relative to um, uh, to where that, that contrast was enhanced. And you see this parametric effect of distance uh, on the propagation time. And in fact, you can um, make that pr propagation time longer by introducing a gap in the annulus, um, as though the inference had to kind of jump over this gap. Uh, and you can model this with the, uh, with the model that I described to you when you impose a, a, this annular topology on the, um, on the underlying latent image. Um, so th this is a nice example of where uh, the switches are not unitary in the sense that the, you, you don't always see the whole image switch. Uh, sometimes you see just parts of the image switch, and that has a dynamic uh, that you can capture with um, MCMC applied to um, these graphical models. Another example of this is piecemeal rivalry. Um, so uh, if you make a stimulus really big, then um, uh, it turns out that people have more time spent in this kind of patchy uh, zone where the one image might be uh, dominant in one, uh, in one part of the visual field but not in the other part of the visual field. Um, and and, and you, you're going to require um, more node switches until you uh, achieve a stable percept. So, um, so this is appealing to the idea that if for bigger images, you have to basically do more computation before you have a, um, a large-scale shift in the percept. Um, another interesting aspect of, of rivalry which can be captured by this kind of model is fusion. So, so it turns out that you don't always uh, experience rivalry. Um, so sometimes you have uh, alternations between, uh, uh, sorry, sometimes the, the two stimuli fuse together into a, a unified percept. And you can get this in, in a few different ways. So for example, if you decrease the uh, contrast of the, uh, of the images, then you get more fusion. Or if you make them more similar to each other, uh, like gradings at different orientation, if you make the orientation more similar, then you're more likely to get fusion. Um, and, and this, again, appeals to this idea that the, um, the multistability uh, um, arises because of this multimodal posterior. And when you reduce the contrast or you make the, the images more similar in some feature space, then you're going to be basically reducing the multi, uh, multimodality of the posterior. And, and under some circumstances, you might get a single mode. All right. So to summarize this last section, uh, I've argued that multistability can arise from sampling from a multimodal posterior. Um, and um, sampling can explain a lot of different aspects of th this perceptual multistability. So dominance duration, traveling waves, piecemeal rivalry, and fusion. Um, so now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the application of these models to high-level cognition. Before I do that, any questions or comments so far? OK. Yes? 
Um, so, so Peter Diane actually had a model in 1998 or 1999 of rivalry, which was based on a variational inference algorithm. Um, but to get the um, switching behavior, he needed to introduce a, a fatigue process. And that's often how, in the biophysical models of, of rivalry, they, they introduce some kind of fatigue process to get the switching behavior. Now, I can't speak for all possible variational models. In fact, I mean, one of the things that I'm going to talk about in the next half in the second half of the tutorial is it's very hard to um, pin down the commitments of variational methods without making some more assumptions so for example you could you could have um, sample based variational approximations and you could even have optimization of those sample based approximations operate via some kind of stochastic search so at that point are we even talking about something that's different uh, distinguishable from uh, MCMC algorithms You mean you're talking about which generative model, or maybe I'm not following? Yeah. Not just which generative model, yeah. but what the variable test represents. Right. Like is orientation the same thing as a weight of a matrix function? Yeah. Is that the same thing as experiencing? Well, what do you mean by the same thing? Like, what, in what's, obviously, it's not the same thing, but, but the question is, is can we deduce that similar inference operations are acting upon? Weights and orientations. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'm asking, do you need to think about which one of those, say, the populations you want is doing before you? Yes, I think so, right? Because there's no way to make predictions from an approximate inference algorithm unless you first specify the generative model that it's operating over, right? And, and actually, even what the basic representational primitives are, right? That's what makes it so hard because if, if the model may, the wrong prediction, is that because the, the inference algorithm was wrong, or because the probability model was wrong, or because we just represented the problem in totally the wrong way, or we measured things wrong? There's all sorts of failure modes, and that's what, that's what makes this so hard to do, right? And so I'm kind of giving you the most optimistic reading of these uh, phenomena, but everything is up for debate. I totally accept that. Yeah. Yeah. So, say, say that one more time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Sorry, I broke my promise that I was going to repeat the question. So this, the question was, um, could you get multi-stability in a feed-forward neural network with recur? Well, it's not feed-forward anymore. Feed-forward plus recurrence um, using something like a convolutional neural network of the sort that uh, Jim DeCarlo's lab uses. Um, I mean, yeah, yes, like we, we know from, you know, all of these models that I'm talking about were long predated by more biophysical models for modeling rivalry that are based on dynamical systems. So you can, you can construct dynamical systems that show oscillations, right? That's essentially what it comes down to. Um, uh, so this doesn't exclude any of those, uh, uh, of those kinds of formalizations, but um, at some level, what, what I'm arguing here is that uh, there's an interpretation of the stochasticity, or at least apparent stochasticity, that comes from those models that's consistent with a probabilistic inference or an approximate inference interpretation. Right? So, so we can we can look at we can construct 
if you take the model that I just described, you can write it down as a, as a recurrent neural network. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to talk about that a, a little bit later when I, when I discuss neural circuits. Um, so it, it actually is, at the circuit level, very similar to what those kinds of models would look like. Right? But the advantage of looking at it through the lens of probabilistic inference is that we can have this interpretation that it's sampling from this uh, distribution over latent variables. Okay. So um, I'm going to go on and talk about application of these ideas to high level cognition, but specifically to understanding biases in probabilistic reasoning. Uh, everything okay out there? <laughs> Um, all right. Um, so so uh, consider the following three questions. Um, I ask you, what is the probability of dying from disease? Or what is the probability of dying from heart disease, cancer, stroke, or any other disease? Or what's the probability of dying from pneumonia, diabetes, cirrhosis, or any other disease? Um, so all of these morbid questions have the same answer. Um, because all we've done differently in these different questions is unpacked some particular disjunctive hypothesis into a bunch, the conjunction of a bunch of, um, uh, sorry, the disjunction of a bunch of uh, sub-hypotheses. So, um, uh, so the question here is, even though these, have all the, these all have the same answer, why is it that framing them differently leads to different responses? Um, and let me expl explain to you what the responses are. So there, there's two dominant patterns that happen here. Um, when, you ha when, you unpack, when you unpack a hypothesis into um, typical sub-hypotheses, then you get what's called sub-additivity. Um, so that, that's shown in this green example. So heart disease, cancer, and stroke are all typical uh, fatal diseases, uh, or typical diseases. Um, and, uh, and the idea here is that um, intuitively, if I ask you what's the probability of dying from disease, what you're going to do is enumerate as many diseases as you can think of and evaluate whether you, the probability of dying from each one of those diseases. But because you're resource limited, you're not going to enumerate all possible ways of dying. Uh, um, and so you're only going to enumerate a small number of them. And, and as a consequence, you're going to underestimate the marginal probability. Um, uh, and if I unpack those, for, if I unpack that into a few examples, then um, I can alleviate that underestimation of the marginal probability. It turns out that the opposite thing happens when I unpack them into super uh, into um, atypical examples. So then you get super additivity, um, where now um, when I evaluate the um, um, when I evaluate the sum of these. Um, the, the probabilities that you apply to each of these sub-hypotheses, that turns out to be less than the marginal probability. All right, so why does this happen? Um, let me try to give you some intuitions for this. Um, so what I'm showing you here, the big circle is all the ways that a person could die, and the little circle is all the ways that they can die by disease. Um, and so the goal here is to evaluate the, the area of that little circle relative to, uh, as a proportion of the big circle. Um, so let's suppose that I, I seeded you with an example, an unpacked example, like heart attack. So heart attack would be typical. Um, smallpox would be atypical. Um, now in a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, I'm going to then generate some proposal distribution. Um, so suppose that I proposed skydiving accident. Um, the, um, so if you, if you uh, generated a typical example, then you're more likely to uh, stay, to, to um, prefer the typical example compared to the um, to skydiving, but because it has higher probability. But if I, if if you I seeded you with the atypical example, then um, you're more likely to, you're at least relatively more likely to um, to accept the skydiving accident proposal and move into this low probability region of the hypothesis space. Um, so the the predictions here come from. Uh, Two things. One has to do with anchoring. Uh, anchor, so the initialization of the Markov chain. You're going to be um, uh, you're going to be biased towards the uh, initial state of the Markov chain when you only generate a small number of samples. And um, 
Uh, and there's this idea that um, if you're in a low probability region of the state space, you're more likely to accept other low probability proposals. Um, and so this, this model can predict both subadditivity and superadditivity, but only when the number of samples uh, is small. Um, so we're, we're, we're running this Markov chain and looking at, at um, the re relationship between the marginal probability and the sum of these uh, probabilities of the subhypotheses. Um, and, and so negative means that uh, there's a superadditive effect and positive values on the y-axis indicates that there's a subadditive effect. Um, we've, uh, so, so we've tried to pursue this experimentally uh, in the following somewhat weird experimental paradigm where we ask people to make judgments about hidden objects in a scene. So, that, so we'll, we'll tell people, suppose I'm looking at a table, what are, um, what's the probability of objects like, um, here I'll show you an example, chair, computer, or curtain, or any other um, object um, beginning with the letter C. So you have to evaluate the probability of this disjunctive hypothesis, um, and we can manipulate how we unpack that, um, that, disjunctive, that disjunctive hypothesis. Um, and the reason we chose the scene inferences is we can, we can take advantages of uh, a data set uh, of object co-occurrence frequencies uh, that Michelle Green collected and fit a probabilistic model to this data set, and that gives us basically the, the probabilistic model uh, um, from which we can compute the um, conditional distributions um, that we need to make predictions. Um, so we gave people a bunch of these different questions with different unpackings, and we fit um, this uh, MCMC algorithm with two free parameters. So one is uh, the number of latent objects in the scene, and the other is the number of samples. Um, and we can show that, first of all, we can get subadditivity and superadditivity effects depending on whether the unpacking was typical or atypical, and the model fits this quite well. Um, you might think that, that 230 samples is somewhat large, uh, given what I was saying before about samples being costly. Uh, but on the other hand, we, I would reiterate that we don't actually know how many, uh, we don't know what the utility function is or the cost function over samples is, and so we don't know what is the optimal number of samples uh, ex ante. So in order to make some stronger claim about that, we would need to, to really understand that cost function better. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this. Basically, the point of the second experiment was just to show that using the same parameters, we can get, um, we can get um, predictions for a finer grained um, we can make finer grain predictions for different kinds of unpackings. Um, so let's come back to this question of how many samples, and let's just start from the generic assumption that sampling is costly. We don't know exactly how many samples people are going to take, but we know that they should take fewer samples when we make the sampling more costly. Um, so, um, for example, we can place people under time pressure, um, and we expect that that's going to amplify subadditivity and superadditivity, and that is indeed the case. Um, so if, if you divide people based on fast and slow response, uh, people's responses based on whether they're fast or slow, under fast responses, um, you do see stronger subadditivity and superadditivity effects, and that's consistent with this idea that they're drawing fewer samples under time pressure when they, when they respond quickly. Um, and a similar argument can be made about um, cognitive load. So when we put people under uh, cognitive load, so they have to do a secondary task while, while doing this task, uh, that should amplify the effects. In fact, actually, we, we found that this increased um, superadditivity, but, um, but didn't really have a substantial effect on um, subadditivity. And it turns out that um, these two effects turn out to be asymmetric as a function of the number of samples, and that could potentially explain this asymmetry. So, so um, superadditivity is more sensitive to the number of samples than subadditivity. Um, so you can, uh, you can apply the same logic to a range of other biases that have been documented in the probabilistic reasoning uh, literature. So I'll give you a few examples here. So there's anchoring and adjustment, um, self-generation effect, the dull alternatives effect, the weak evidence effect, and the crowd within. And all of these can be explained in terms of resource-limited sampling um, based on this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, um, so the basic intuition underlying superadditivity is that you essentially get stuck in low probability regions of the hypothesis space. Uh, and this can also explain dot alternative and weak evidence effects. So here's what the weak evidence effect is. Um, so um, if, if I present positive evidence in favor of a weak uh, cause, then um, 
that will actually lead to the outcome being judged to be lower probability. Uh, so for example, I ask, what is the probability that a person died of disease given that her great aunt has diabetes? Um, so this slightly increases the probability of the outcome, um, but, the, the, but what, um, what also happens is that it, it causes the initialization at an atypical example, and this produces an overall underestimation of the probability. In, in, um, and essentially, this is a version of superadditivity. Um, another interesting version of superadditivity is the dud alternative effect. Um, so this is where the judge probability of a focal outcome um, is higher when implausible alternatives are presented. So for example, what is the probability that a person died due to disease as opposed to a skydiving accident? And this is essentially superadditivity in the complement space. So uh, now uh, P not A, so uh, um, the probability of not dying um, due to disease is underestimated because of initialization at an atypical example. So it's, kind of, so, so it's sort of the flip side of superadditivity. Um, you can also explain uh, anchoring and adjustment phenomena. So um, the idea that there's a bias towards primed hypotheses, and this is reduced when subjects take more time. So there, there are classic experiments by Kahneman and Tversky that showed, for example, if I tell you, um, if I ask you, what's, what are the last four digits of your social security number? And then I ask you a question like, what year was Gandhi born? Um, and it turns out that if your social security number was low, is lower, you're going to have uh, estimates of Gandhi's birth date that, that are lower. Um, so it's a totally irrelevant anchor, but if you think that it somehow infiltrates your hypothesis set, then um, it will uh, pull estimates down. And specifically because you're anchoring, uh, you, you show this um, because of the autocorrelation and the small number of samples, which means that you'll be sensitive, sensitive to the initialization. Um, uh, another interesting observation about this is that you can re reduce autocorrelation by um, thinning the Markov chain. So if I introduce larger time gaps between uh, subsequent measurements, um, then I'm going to reduce autocorrelation, um, and that's going to reduce the error. So, so the, the estimation error for a, given, for a given number of samples is going to go down if I thin it more aggressively. But of course, that means that I need to draw more samples. Um, and there, there's some evidence for this from, from Ed Vol and Hal Paschler, who showed that um, you can get people's estimates to be more accurate if you ask them the same question multiple times separated by longer gaps. Um, and, and another observation related to this is that, uh, of course, there's much less autocorrelation between people than within people. And so if you average answers between people, you're going to get um, lower error compared to if you average answers within a person because of this autocorrelation. Um, okay, so to summarize this last part, um, we've seen before that you can explain low-level perceptual phenomena, but you can also explain a lot of high-level probabilistic reasoning phenomena using the same basic ideas about autocorrelation and a, a, small num a generation of a small number of samples. Um, and, that, and that's all, the, the small number of samples constraint derives again from uh, this idea of computational rationality. Yeah? Uh, this one? Yeah. Here is that you, you are, are considering skydiving, right? Because because that that's still in the hypothesis space, right? You're still able to generate hypotheses outside of the disease region of that space. Right, but yeah. the way this one is framed is as if like, what is the probability that a person died of disease versus skydiving? Mm-hmm. And it's yes, it's more likely that a person dies of disease. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, so this, we're, we're making the assumption here that 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 potentially your your you could be you could be generating samples both in the um, um, focal space and in the complement space. Right? So, so you could be evaluating both hypotheses simultaneously. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe we can take this offline. Okay. Um, any other questions before we talk about go back to neural sampling? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear that. Can you say again? I want to talk about the example of the social security number. Yes. Yeah. It assumes that people apply the same market process for both questions. And what evidence is there that the two starting points of the market processes are influencing each other? What are the two market processes? Yeah. Uh, what evidence is there that this should be the case? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, it, we can model anchoring effects by assuming that this prime initializes the second Markov chain. I don't even know, I, I wouldn't even go so far as to say that there's a Markov chain for the social security number, right? Um, you have no uncertainty about your social security number, right? Um, that does seem a little bit outlandish, right? Why would people use this clearly irrelevant number uh, to initialize their Markov chain, right? Uh, and I think that, that that is a puzzle, right? Because you'd think that people were, would be smarter than to, that they'd have some kind of relevance filter. And maybe they do, um, but it, there might be still some sort of subtler source of bias there. Um, and, and in fact, the when I talk about amortized inference, one of the goals of, of um, modeling amortized inference is to explain the origins of these anchoring effects uh, in a sort of a more principled way. Like right now we're just making the, the simple assumption that I tell you something and you just stick it into your um, sample set, but maybe there's something more subtle going on, like maybe you're learning how to map from examples to an initialization or something like that. Were there other questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, there are different choices we could make about how we map from the samples to reports, right? So you could collect a bunch of samples and then report some summary statistic of those samples. Possibly uh, you have some utility function that you are optimizing with respect to that sample-based approximation. Or maybe you're even just reporting you know, samples as they come in one at a time. So, but those two are very different, right? One is like you generate 100 samples in the Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's some there's some in between zone here, right? Because if you generate a small number of samples, then um, it's going to be something in between saying the first thing that popped into your head and you know optimizing some utility function with respect to the sample set. Right. So the question yeah. is, do we? Is there an Well, I've tried to make the argument that, the, at least as far as applications of the data I've talked about, it's consistent with um, using a small number of samples. Right? You get probability matching specifically when you have a small number of samples, not when you have a large number of samples. Because in general, if you have an accurate sampler, you're going to um, converge to the, to the true posterior um, in the limit. And so you're not going to show any of these biases at all. Now, another possibility is that you don't have an accurate sampler. You, have, you take a large number of samples from a bad sampler that doesn't have the right asymptotic properties. And that, that's, that is a conceivable hypothesis, but I haven't seen any, um, I haven't seen any 
examples of that really investigated. Yes, that's that's right. Or or some some de depending on what the pro the nature of the problem is, sometimes you could t do things like take a running average of the samples, and you don't need to keep them in memory. Okay. But that that depends on the specifics of the problem. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Well, well I, I should. So the question is, you know, is, are these are those neural effects only going to happen at equilibrium? And I mean, I, I don't. Maybe someone here knows the answer to this, but I, I would suspect my intuition is that you wouldn't only see these effects at equilibrium. So you would, even if the the Markov chain hasn't reached equilibrium, you would still see, for example, differences between spontaneous and evoked activity. Uh, that um, I mean, I guess it depends on how, you know, how far away from equilibrium we're talking about, right? But but all, all other things being equal, that's my intuition. Another thing yeah. that, for example, the evoked activity seems to be rote, but the positive that the sampling directions are How many samples can you really get over that time span of evoked activity? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah. The question is, if, if, we're, if we're taking into account the cost of sampling, do we pre-compute the cost of sampling? Oh, sorry, how many samples we're going to take? Or is it some, do we have some kind of any time algorithm that can determine when to uh, stop sampling? I think that's a super interesting question. I, I don't know of any um, evidence that specifically answers that question. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I think so. One thing that I think we can say is that there is some evidence from Jess Hamrick and Falk Leader, uh, where they, they they make the argument that there's some adaptive level of sampling. So the number of samples is not fixed. It depends on the uh, the cost benefit ratio. Um, but the, what I don't know is whether any evidence specifically suggests that people are determining on the fly whether to stop sampling or determining a fixed number of samples at the beginning. Okay, so we'll keep going. So, so let's go back to neural dynamics of sampling. Um, and now, now, so before we were talking about neural, neural sampling in a very generic way, uh, by as just generating samples from the posterior, but now I want to talk about um, neural uh, the, the specific dynamical properties of that sampling as instantiating uh, an MCMC algorithm. Um, and actually, if you go back to the kinds of models that I was showing you before to model uh, vernacular rivalry, so those are technically Markov random fields, um, you, can write down, um, you, can, you can write down the, um, the dynamics of Gibbs sampling in a way that looks a lot like the dynamics of, um, uh, of, of neurons arranged in, a, in a sort of a generic network. So um, a Markov random field can always be expressed as this probability that's um, an exponential of a negative energy function. Um, and the energy function for, for, for a simple um, 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 uh, Ising model is going to be the, this um, bilinear function of, the, of these binary states. So, so this, we're now imagining the, the states as being um, a collection of binary random variables, and we have this weight matrix that determines um, the symmetric connections between those neurons. Um, obviously, there's aspects of this that are biologically implausible, like the symmetry, um, but we're going to just put that aside for a moment. And now we're going to say, um, uh, now we're going to define a transition function, which is um, the transition function used by Gibbs sampling, where we condition on all the, the neurons except uh, one and sample from the conditional di distribution of that one neuron, conditional on all the other ones, and you get uh, um, a rule which, is, which will be familiar to many of you, which is uh, you take the, the summed weighted activations, the inputs to that neuron, and then you pass it through a logistic sigmoid and draw a sample from that Bernoulli distribution. So this is basically like a discrete time analog uh, of a linear, nonlinear Poisson process. Um, uh, 
And, um, um, but, what's, what, and you can, but you can interpret this as sampling from um, this mark of random fields probability distribution. And if you clamp any of those states, um, then those, those act as data. Those are the visible units. And then the other units are, are the hidden units. Um, and I'll mention just one other thing about this that, it is, that some of you may already know, that um, this is very closely related to hot field networks. So hot field networks are basically like the zero temperature limit of this of this model. Um, OK. Uh, so if we just start with some of the, um, the um, summary statistics that people have um, quantified about um, variability, neural variability, for example, in V1, um, you, you, can, you can set up this, net, this kind of network to, to emulate some aspects of the um, known properties of, of um, V1 neurons. So for example, you can get skewed um, interspike interval distributions and a coefficient of variation that's close to one. Um, th but those are not really um, unique properties of this particular kind of network. But th I I'd refer you to um, Lars Busing's paper, which was kind of the first paper to really take seriously this neural dynamics as sampling idea and, and look at um, how you could uh, take that basic network architecture that I just showed you and make it more biological, uh, biologically plausible, for example, by introducing refractive peri refractory periods and things like that. Um, there's other evidence, uh, of, um, for example, of multi-stability in the hippocampus where you get um, things like flickering between different place field maps or, um, or um, place fields uh, that seem to be poorly correlated with each other across repeated, presentation, uh, repeated entries into the same environment. Um, and by analogy with how we understood perceptual multistability, it's tempting to interpret these kinds of phenomena as uh, multistability in the neural representation of space. Um, but I think a lot more work has to be done to really make that argument plausible. Uh, right now, it's just kind of suggestive evidence. Um, now. Gibbs sampling is very convenient in the sense that it, it's easy to imagine how a neural circuit could implement Gibbs sampling. But it's not very efficient. Um, and it's not very efficient in the following sense. So um, Gibbs sampling is known to often give rise to random walk behaviors. And in, in, in essence, what that means is that the, the network is going to get stuck in local optima because it's doing these local changes in, in a very undirected way. So it's kind of exploring randomly in some region of the, uh, of the space. And, um, and it's not going to move very quickly along the energy function. I mean, it eventually will generate samples um, that, that occupy low energy states. Um, but it could take a really long time. Uh, and that's why statisticians and, and even before them physicists had developed um, techniques for more efficient sampling from probability distributions where, uh, and th this specifically applies to cases where, you, where the, um, the um, probability distribution is differentiable. And so we can basically take advantage of gradient information in the energy function to follow, to do a, a directed um, stochastic sampling of that distribution. So we can kind of move along low energy reg uh, regions of that distribution. Uh, and this is sometimes known as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And the basic idea is that you can, you can implement this by introducing an auxiliary variable and alternate between sampling from the auxiliary variable um, and sampling from the variable of the state variable. Um, and, and Lawrence Aitchison and Mate Lengel have developed a specific neural implementation of this. And maybe Mate will talk about this in, in his keynote talk. Um, and um, the way that they do this is that they have excitatory neurons that represent the latent variables, the state variables. And then you have inhibitory neurons, which represent the auxiliary variables. And these are reciprocally connected. Um, and they both receive input from the stimulus. Uh, they receive stimulus input. And if you set this up correctly so that, um, th that these two variables are basically um, uh, drawing, uh, are, are, the, the dynamics of these variables depend on the gradient of the log probability distribution, um, then you can show that this exactly implements Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and is much more efficient than the kinds of Gibbs sampling algorithms that I showed you before. And it also produces some interesting uh, emergent properties. Um, so for example, you can get um, oscillations from this because of the um, ex uh, reciprocal 
inhibition, and you can also get um, balanced excitation and inhibition, which is a, a hallmark of, or well, d arguably a hallmark of, of cortical activity. Um, another interesting idea is to apply MCMC not to uh, activities of neurons, but to actually synaptic plasticity. So one thing that we know about um, dendrites is that the volume of dendritic spines varies continuously over time and possibly stochastically. Um, so if you, if you image some synapse at any given time, it, it's, there's going to be highly variable configuration of, of uh, dendritic spines. Um, and they're, they're, and sp new spines are continuously being formed, and existing ones are also continuously being eliminated. Um, and um, one interpretation of this is that um, this variability arises from some kind of sampling-based inference over the synaptic strength, so over the, so the, yeah, uh, so the, the, the parameters of the graphical model. Um, this was explored in more detail by um, Kappel and Wilkin Moss and colleagues, and I, I'm not going to go into detail, but I, I'll just refer you to this paper if you're interested in learning more. And they, they basically showed how you could set up synaptic plasticity rules that, are, that stochastically sample from the distribution of um, synaptic strengths. Uh, and then you can interpret this as a, as a MCMC algorithm. Yeah. All right, yeah, so, so um, let's go back to this graphical model as an example, okay? So this is, assumes that we know W, this weight matrix, but we don't know S, the state variable. So we're trying to infer the state variable um, conditional on knowing what the underlying parameters of the graphical model are, W, right? But you could also have uncertainty about W itself, right? And uh, we can write down, um, uh, so typically, what, what we would do is we would treat this as a point estimation problem, and we'd write down plasticity rules that estimate a single value for W. Right? That's the standard way that it's usually done, but we could alternatively treat this as a probability estimation problem and, and try to infer the whole posterior distribution over W. Uh, and that, that's kind of the, the, the logic of this synaptic sampling idea. That, that, that distribution is going to be intractable, but we can stochastically sample it via MCMC in the same way that... Uh, or analogous to the way that we would sample the state variable. Um, okay, so to summarize so far, um, um, MCMC can account for many aspects of neural and cognitive dynamics. Um, you know, one, con one general concern here is that it's slow, right? It's going to take a while to... Um, generate all of those samples. And I think this goes back to, to your question, or one of your guys' questions about, um, you know, is this plausible for generating samples at the time scale that we're looking at activity? Um, so I think that's an important question. Um, um, and, um, and one that the subsequent section is going to address. So uh, I'll mention one other thing, which is it's not really well designed for tasks that require online inference. So suppose the data are streaming. They're, they're coming in a stream, and you need to update your posterior online you don't want to have to be rerunning the Markov chain over and over again at every time step, right? So that seems highly implausible. Right? Um, so that motivates a different class of algorithms based on important sampling. So here's the basic idea of important sampling. So instead of distributing samples in time, like MCMC algorithms, we're going to distribute them in space. So imagine that we're going to draw a whole bunch of samples simultaneously. Um, but again, the, the problem comes back to bite us, which is how do you actually generate those samples? So we're going to assume that you can sample from some other distribution, phi, which is easy to sample from. Um, and then what we're going to do is construct a weighted um, set of delta functions from those samples. And the weights are going to depend on both the, the um, generative model and the um, this proposal distribution, phi. Uh, and the specific functional form of the weights is given here. Um, so uh, on the, in the numerator, it's just the joint probability of the samples and the data. Uh, and in the denominator, is phi, the, the probably that, um, that phi puts on those samples, and that's to compensate for the fact that you're sampling from the wrong distribution. Um, and you'll notice that um, if we assume that you're sampling from your prior, then this simplifies um, so that the weights are just normalized likelihoods. Um, and this, this idea has been exploited to um, formalize a particular neural implementation of important sampling uh, that she and Griffiths developed. And the idea here is that um, we have a bunch of stimulus-tuned neurons, 
Um, and these, the, the tuning functions of these neurons basically corresponds to, are directly encoding the likelihood function. And then these neurons are being recruited with probability proportional to the prior. So th that would imply that the, that the distribution of preferred stimuli um, should correspond to the prior. Um, and then basically what you can do is very simply uh, just take the activations of these, of these uh, stimulus tuned neurons uh, that are recruited in pr pr probability proportional to the prior. Um, and once you normalize them appropriately, you can get um, the, the correct posterior probability out of this, asymptotically at least. Um, so they apply this to the oblique effect, which is the finding that um, uh, sensitivity to orientation is greater for cardinal orientations than for um, oblique orientations. Uh, and there is a, a normative explanation for this, an ecological explanation, which is that if you look at natural images, um, cardinal orientations are much more frequent than um, oblique orientations. And so it makes sense that you would want to uh, represent those as, with higher probability. Um, and th the way that they implement this in their model is assuming that um, th that the, the distribution of uh, neurons tuned to particular orientations follows this um, ecological distribution, so this ecological prior, so that you have more neurons that are tuned to cardinal orientations than oblique orientations. And that seems to be consistent um, with uh, the data on neural tuning curves, uh, neural tuning curves in V1. Um, so let's talk now about um, particle filtering, um, which is the dynamic, the online version of um, uh, important sampling. So the idea here is that I'm getting data, um, one data point at a time, and I can recursively update my importance weights using the following simple formula. Right? So I'm just recomputing my importance weights but multipl by multiplying this new likelihood with the previous importance uh, weight, and then renormalizing. Um, and, and this has um, an interesting um, property, but I have to tell you one more thing about particle filtering, uh, which make, will make this make more sense, which is that uh, if you do this, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where many of the particles are conditionally unlikely. They have really low importance weights. So effectively, they're not doing any work for you in the, in the procedure. So ideally, you'd like to get rid of them um, by deleting them and resampling uh, from the, uh, <clears throat> resampling the particles according to their importance weights. So, so the idea is that I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to keep a particle around in proportion to its importance weight and then continue updating those, the particles that have survived that resampling step. Um, and so that's going to get rid of conditionally unlikely particles. Um, but the problem is that what it also means is that if some particle now becomes conditionally likely later on for, for later evidence, you're not going to have that particle around anymore. Uh, and so you're not going to be able to have the correct interpretation for that later evidence. Uh, and that leads to, the, so this is essentially a kind of order effect, and you see this um, behaviorally in, in what are known as garden paths. So this is most commonly studied in linguistics. Um, and this is the situation where initially promising hypotheses are invalidated by later data. So, um, so humans are getting stuck with their initial hypothesis and fail to infer the correct hypothesis. Um, and as I said, this could be accounted for by some kind of resampling step in the particle filter. Um, so here are a few examples of garden paths in linguistics. Um, these are sentences, you read them, and at first you don't quite get them, and you have to kind of go back and figure out what they mean. So the old man, the boat. Yeah? The horse raced past the barn and fell. The horse uh, that raced past the barn fell, right? That's, but, so, so if you think about um, what's going on here, the problem is that the first part of the sentence suggested a particular syntactic interpretation that was invalidated by the later part of the sentence. Um, and uh, Roger Levy and colleagues have, have formalized this in a particular parsing, uh, stochastic parsing model. So the, the idea is that the particle filter is now doing inference over parse trees. Um, but, but because of resampling, it's going to delete some of these uh, parse trees. Um, so he uses this example of the woman uh, brought the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. Uh, and there's basically two, you, we can focus our attention on two interpretations, uh, a, a main verb construction and a reduced relative construction. So initially, um, the main verb construction is favored by the initial data, um, but, then that, but then by the end of the sentence, the reduced relative construction is favored. Um, 
But the problem is that if you've deleted the reduced relative construction because it was conditionally unlikely, then you, you have trouble parsing the sentence and you have to go back. Um, um, now, this concept, the, the idea of garden paths is actually um, um, more general than just linguistics. So we've studied this in, in concept learning, so specifically in number concept learning. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to tell you about this uh, series of studies is because um, we were interested in what kinds of algorithms are really scalable to more complex compositional hypothesis spaces that have you know, a, very, a much vaster space of, um, uh, much vaster, uh, vaster hypothesis space than what I've been telling you about. So um, we used a sequential version of the number game, and I'll explain to you what that is. Um, and we, we explored whether putting people under cognitive load would exacerbate uh, garden paths effects. So we were also trying to look at the, this kind of computational rationality interpretation to see if um, reduction of resource availability, availability will have an effect on garden paths. Um, so here's how the sequential number game works. Um, so I'm going to give you a number, and you're, and you're going to have to tell me which other numbers between 1 and 100 belong to the same number concept. Um, in other words, uh, I'm, I'm generating a con um, samples from some concept like numbers between um, 1 and 10, or even numbers, or odd numbers, or powers of 2. Um, but I can also generate from compositional number concepts, like even numbers between 20 and 40. Right? Um, so, uh, so the way this works is I'm showing these, number, these numbers sequentially, uh, and, then, um, and then subjects on each trial are going to give you this, the extension of that, the hypothetical extension of that number concept. Um, and the, the critical thing that, that we did here was this order manipulation. Um, where we took the same set of numbers, but we changed where in the sequence the number 31 appeared. And the reason this is relevant is because uh, intuitively, when you see 31 early, then you favor the hypothesis numbers between 20 and 40. But if you um, see the, num the number 31 late, then you favor the hypothesis multiples of three. Um, so here's what the data look like. Um, oh yeah, and I, I forgot to mention that we, we put under, under, some of our subjects we put under distraction, so they had to execute a working memory task simultaneously while doing this task. Um, and, um, and so I'm comparing distractor and no distractor crossed with whether the uh, number 31 came early or it came late. And so you can see that when the, when, let's just look at the no distractor conditions um, first. Um, uh, so the, the, the um, People favored the, uh, sorry, let's just look at early versus late, so under no distractor. So people favor the, the um, numbers between 30 and 40 um, concept uh, um, when the distractor came early, but they favored this uh, concept of, of um, they, they had some kind of mixture of the concepts of um, uh, multiples of three and numbers between 30 and 40. Uh, when the distractor came late. And I should, should mention that what I'm showing you here are the responses at the very last trial, OK? So, that, so they've seen the entire sequence of numbers at that point. Um, so you can see now that there is an order effect um, consistent with the intuition that I just gave you, and that that order effect is exacerbated, particularly in the late condition, um, uh, when I put people under uh, cognitive load with this distractor. And we can capture this with this um, particle filtering model um, by assuming that there, there's this resampling step, and also that when, you, um, um, when you're under distraction, you have fewer particles available um, to represent this hypothesis space. Okay. Um, uh, similar to how uh, she and Griffiths implemented uh, important sampling in a neural circuit, um, Huang and Rao have developed um, a neural implementation of particle filtering. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into much detail about this, but essentially it's a similar idea, except that um, the, the, um, because we're now talking about um, updating dynamically, the, um, what they've done is implemented the, um, this forward transition model this, um, for a dynamical system in, um, in the recurrent connections, and then the feed-forward connections um, correspond to the observation model. So the feed-forward connections are providing um, the likelihood function and the, and the recurrent connections are providing the dynamics of the prior. Uh, and then they showed that you can, that this kind of model can, can, ca um, can generate stochastic samples that can capture things like uh, multimodal distributions, but um, it's still an open question whether 
this kind of model um, will produce the kinds of uh, garden path effects that, that we saw in, um, uh, in the cognitive studies. So there's still a, a gap between the cognitive studies and what we understand about the neural implementation. Okay. Um, so to summarize so far, um, particle filtering offers a psychologically neurally plausible mechanism for online approximate inference. So it, it, it fixes some of the problems that MCMC had in the sense that uh, you can distribute samples in space, you can sample online, um, so it's more temporally efficient, but it, it also creates some problems that MCMC didn't have as much of an issue with. Uh, for example, it gets, it's more vulnerable to getting stuck in poor optima compared to MCMC because it can't really do a local search. Um, however, we can augment, MCM, uh, sorry, augment important sampling particle filtering algorithms with um, what sometimes is called rejuvenation, which essentially is a hybridization of MCMC and important sampling where we apply MCMC transition functions to the samples in a, um, in a particle filter. Um, and that can ameliorate this problem. So it kind of combines the strengths of these two approaches. Um, all right, so the last thing that I want to talk about just briefly uh, in, before we take a break is um, combining spatial and temporal codes. Um, so we've talked about spatial codes like important sampling and particle filtering and uh, probabilistic population codes, and we've also talked about temporal codes like MCMC, and these have complementary strengths and weaknesses, so the spatial codes are fast but inflexible in the sense that they, they can't really be, um, uh, th th that they may, ha they may struggle with more complex distributions, uh, even though they have the speed advantage, whereas temporal codes can be more flexibly applied to a broader range of distributions, but they're slow. Um, so can we combine the relative advantages of these approaches? Um, so Christina Savin and um, Sophie Deneuve have developed one particular answer to this question, where they assume that samplers are distributed both in space across neurons and across time. Um, so the underlying signal is kind of multiplexed spatiotemporally, and then um, they have a, a, a linear readout which decodes this spatiotemporal information into, the, um, uh, into an inference about the latent signal, and you can learn those decoding weights. Um, and th they've demonstrated how this could um, lead to um, dramatic efficiency gains because now you're basically sampling, in effect, with multiple parallel chains. Um, so you can approximate this, the posterior in a fraction of the time that you'd require from a single chain. Um, so th there are interesting psychological inter implications of this uh, parallel sampling as well. Um, so for example, uh, if you uh, ask someone to do something like um, repeatedly estimate a constant time interval, so you're presenting um, stimulus events at some constant time interval, um, uh, you, see, uh, you see, in people's estimates, you see um, a power law autocorrelation function. Um, so it has this functional form that I've drawn here where k is the lag between samples. Um, and um, there's some interesting work by uh, Xu, Sanborn, and Chater that showed that this kind of power law autocorrelation function could arise from sampling multiple chains simultaneously. But they had the, the additional twist, which is that they allowed the different chains to be at different temperatures. So they actually had this whole hierarchy of temperatures from, from cold chains that are low temperature to hot chains at high temperature. So the hot chains at high temperature are, are sampling much more broadly, but are exploring low energy parts of the state space, whereas the cold chains uh, tend to focus on, on the only the, the, the uh, sorry, they're, they're, the hot chains are exploring high energy parts of the state space, and the cold chains are exploring uh, low energy parts of the state space. But you can, you can develop a, a Metropolis Hastings algorithm that can propose swaps between um, um, states, uh, between, between the chains. Um, and that has the effect of basically propagating um, exploratory samples from the hot chains into the cold chains. And um, this kind of compl complicated machinery, which was originally developed by physicists and sometimes known as the replica method, um, can produce these kinds of power law autocorrelation functions as well as a number of interesting dynamical properties of, of human sample generation. So it's at least suggestive evidence that maybe this idea of multiple parallel chains has some face uh, validity. All right. Um, so interim conclusions from this section is that we can combine spatial and temporal codes um, via multiple chains. Um, this is, I think, this is still pretty speculative. Like we don't, I don't think we have any direct evidence of multiple chains even at different temperatures happening in the brain, but that would be really cool if someone could find evidence for that. Um, and there's some provisional evidence that me mental sampling uses these multiple chains. Um, so 
in the last few minutes, I, I just wanted to bring up a few other considerations. So one thing that I haven't talked about is energy efficiency. Um, so w one argument for sampling could be that instead of representing a complete parametric distribution that could be quite complicated, we generate only um, a small number of samples, and that could lead to um, uh, energy efficiency gains. And we all know that the brain is, um, m seems to be much more energy efficient than um, conventional computers. So could this help us build low energy neuromorphic devices, for example? Um, and then there's another question which, which we um, broached before, which is parsing sources of variability. So um, there's not only going to be variability due to sampling, there's also going to be variability due to noisy perception, uh, model misspecification, noisy decisions, um, and so on. And so, so really to make strong inferences about any of this stuff, we need to have a, a better handle on what the different sources of variability are. Um, so I'll stop there and see if you guys have any questions or comments. Yeah. Can you speak louder, please? Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I, I haven't heard of any applications of that. Yeah. All right, I think it sounds like people are anxious to get to the coffee break, so why don't we do that and we'll reconvene in, in half an hour. All right, so we've talked about Monte Carlo algorithms, and now we're going to talk about variational methods. All right, so um, here's the basic idea of variational inference. Uh, it's, the idea is to convert an inference problem into an optimization problem. Um, and what I mean by that is that we can t think about the, a set of distributions or parameterized distributions, and we want to pick the distribution in that set that comes closest to the true posterior. Um, and um, usually closeness here is measured in terms of uh, Kullback-Leibler divergence. Um, uh, I'll come back later to other forms of divergences, but, but this is kind of the canonical divergence measure uh, between probability distributions. Um, and so the optimization problem is the following. So we're going to try to find the, the um, approximate posterior Q within some restricted variational family um, that uh, optimizes, the, uh, that minimizes the divergence with the true posterior. Um, and uh, uh, now the problem, though, is, well, there's a few different problems. So first of all, this optimization is intractable because um, it requires that we have access to the true posterior. How do we compute the divergence if we don't know what the true posterior is? Um, there's also a question which we'll come back to shortly, which is how do you choose the restriction on the variational family so that, it's, um, so that this optimization problem is tractable? Um, so it turns out that you can reformulate this in a different way by using the following identity. So the log marginal likelihood, that's log P of D, can be decomposed uh, into the sum of, um, the, uh, of the divergence term and this other functional F, which is the variational free energy. And the variational free energy has the property that it is tractable to compute. It, um, well, it is tractable subject to some constraints, which I'll mention in a second, but, but the important thing is it doesn't require access to the direct posterior. It only requires access to the unnormalized posterior, so the joint distribution, the, the, the product of the prior and the likelihood. It's, and in general, basically all the al uh, approximate inference algorithms we've talked about assume that you can compute the product of the prior and the likelihood for any particular sample. Um, the free energy here also requires that um, you be able to compute this expectation under the approximate uh, distribution Q. And that's what's going to require some further restrictions on, that, on the form that that distribution takes. Um, but the, so, so the, assuming you can compute that expectation um, and, and solve this optimization problem, minimizing the, the free energy is going to produce the same approximate posterior as minimizing um, the KL divergence, um, but it's tractable because it doesn't require access to the true posterior. OK. Um, these first few slides, this is, you know, variational inference is often the, the hardest form of approximate inference for people to get. So, you know, you should stop me at any point if, if things are unclear. Um, so how do we, what kind of restrictions do we need to place on the variational family uh, to make this um, optimization tractable? So there's a few different possibilities. Um, the, 
the, the most common kind of the classical restriction is called the mean field approximation, and it goes has a long history in physics in statistical physics. And so the idea here is that the posterior factorizes across dimensions of the state space. So we're going to enforce that the posterior can be decomposed into the product of a bunch of of dimension specific um, um, posterior distributions. Uh, and you should keep in mind that in general that's not going to be the case. In general, the posterior is not going to factorize in this way. But the advantage of factorizing the posterior in this way is that now we, we only need to take expectations with respect to each individual dimension as opposed to the whole joint configuration space. Um, and, that, and that renders c computing the free energy tractable. And it also renders, um, it also allows us to derive um, a, uh, a, um, a coordinate descent optimization procedure where we um, can iteratively redu uh, minimize the, f the free energy with respect to each of these dimensions and then just keep iterating that and that will be guaranteed to reach a, a local minimum of the free energy. And uh, the, the problem of op globally optimizing free energy is, is um, not tractable for most uh, distributional assumptions. Um, okay, there, but there are other choices of, of restrictions on the variational family. So for example, um, I could impose a certain functional form on the distribution, like I could, I could uh, posit that the variational uh, approximation is a weighted sum of delta functions, um, and then the parameters that I want to optimize are both the, the positions of those delta functions, so, so what are the, the states, and then the weights. Uh, and it turns out you can do this uh, in a tra computationally tractable way, um, and it turns out the optimal weights are just the normalized joint probabilities. Um, and this has an interesting connection to important sampling. So we're, the important sampling stochastically constructs um, this Monte Carlo approximation and, and weights the samples. Here, we're asking, suppose that I give you k samples. What is the best possible uh, approximation that you could come up with um, um, for minimizing the KL divergence with the approximate posterior? And this variational particle approximation um, gives the answer to that question. Um, and, it, and it can be deterministically constructed, but it can also be stochastically constructed. So for example, in high dimensional spaces, you might want to stochastically search for the particles. And so then it, it blends together some of the Monte Carlo algorithms that we were talking about before and the variational algorithms that, so combining kind of stochastic sampling and optimization perspectives on approximate inference. Um, questions so far? Okay. Um, there's one more important um, restriction that, uh, that will be important for some of the, the empirical modeling, which is called the Laplace approximation. So the idea is that if your state space is, is continuous, it could be continuous and multidimensional, um, we can approximate the posterior as a Gaussian around the mode. And one reason that this makes sense, um, at least in some situations, is that th there's something called the Bayesian central limit theorem, um, which says that uh, for continuous spaces under some regularity assumptions, if, as you get more data, the posterior will be increasingly Gaussian around the mode, and, it, and eventually will actually collapse to a point at the mode. Um, and so this motivates, or sort of justifies, the, the use of a Laplace approximation, the use of a Gaussian approximation around the mode of the distribution. Um, uh, now, there's some mathematical tricks here that, that we don't need to worry too much about, but basically, if you take a second order Taylor series expansion to approximate the log joint probability, um, as a quadratic function around the mode, then we can actually calculate the free energy analytically. So, so it looks something like this. Um, so here's this non-Gaussian distribution, but we're approximating it as a Gaussian around the, uh, around the mode. And under, using this Taylor series expansion, we can calculate the, the free energy and actually optimize this um, Gaussian approximation. Um, okay, so why am I telling you all this stuff? Well. Because that's all of the, the setup that you need to understand one of the most influential ideas about variational approximations in the brain, which is predictive coding. Um, so um, it turns out that if you make a mean field assumption combined with a Laplace approximation, combined with the Taylor series expansion, then you can, you, with all those, those dominoes stacked in place, then you can actually derive um, rules for um, inference, in the, approximate inference in the brain that have, uh, at least at a conceptual level, 
um, a, a pleasingly simple form. Now, in practice, it's more complicated than this. I'm simplifying, but but this is this formulation is going to be sufficient to get the gist of um, the idea. So so um, if we can approximate the Bessier as Gaussian, and and um, we can use the Taylor series so we can compute gradients of that of the free energy. Then you can write down changes in your expectations as proportional to precision weighted prediction errors. Right? So the thing in parentheses is your prediction errors, the discrepancy between the observed data and your expectation. Um, and then um, lambda is the precision. This is like the reliability of the data. Um, and it's importantly, you can stack this hierarchically so the data could actually be. Um, the, the, the data might actually be expectations generated by one level of the hierarchy. And so you can, you can um, organize this whole predictive coding machinery hierarchically. Um, and, um, and the idea is that you're one, the, um, there are feed forward, uh, there's a feed forward pathway that's propagating prediction errors. And then there's a feedback pathway that's propagating the predictions, the expectations. Um, and those expectations are getting updated according to this rule. Um, so that's pleasingly simple, uh, at least in this abstract form. Um, but I just wanted to pause for a second and emphasize that to get to this kind of formulation, you have to have a lot of assumptions in place. And it's a common misconception that predictive coding and the free energy principle go hand in hand. And that's not true, that the predictive coding um, algorithm is not a generic consequence of free energy minimization of variational methods. So it depends on the restriction on the variational family. It depends on the particular um, way that you're approximating the free energy using a Taylor series expansion. And it depends on the idea that you're doing some kind of gradient descent on the free energy in this continuous parameter space. Um, so you need a whole bunch of assumptions in place. Um, that's important to keep in mind. Um, so that's, that's the kind of the technical part about predictive coding and free energy principle. and, and I, I encourage you guys to also go to this debate between Carl Frist and Jeff Beck, which I'm sure will be something to watch. Um, <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, Zach, you had something to add? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, Friston has derived versions of this for dynamical models, and I just didn't want to make it too complicated here. But yeah. But the same sort of idea applies here. He he comes. He has this like generalized coordinate system for. Doing the um, predict the the um, the Laplace approximation, but what, why do you why do you bring that up? Or you just wanted to add that that's another restriction? Uh, yeah. Well, when you have the policies in there, when the, when the agent is choosing actions, yeah. Then which actions it takes the free energy principles is interesting in that respect. That it may give you different results here, or it may right, right. Spot. Oh, I see. Yeah, so I actually, I was sort of sneakily hoping to avoid this, but since you bring it up, I'll, uh, I'll mention it, which is that another important thing that comes up a lot in discussions of free energy is active inference. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll try to repeat the question. The, the question was what happens when, you, when policies interact with inference, basically, um, roughly speaking. Um, so that, that's the focus of a lot of uh, work from Carl Friston and others on... Um, what if you can take actions to reduce free energy? Um, that, that's, that's what's called active inference, and that will have some interplay with this predictive coding machinery, because now, now your policy is going to have an effect on, on um, the prediction errors. The policy is actually going to be designed to reduce those prediction errors. Um, but I, I, the reason I didn't want to talk about this in, in this context is because um, I, I'm trying to stay as pristine as possible and only talk about approximate inference and not action selection. But of course, in any kind of real agent, you have to think about those things jointly. Uh, and, and actually, um, Friston deliberately blurs the boundary between those. So, so, so one of the more controversial claims of the free energy principle, which I'm sure is going to come under debate uh, at this debate, is um, whether you can take uh, decision theory and basically just turn that all, all aspects of decision theory into a probabilistic inference problem. So instead of uh, doing the normal decision theoretic thing where you have a separation between utilities or rewards and beliefs, so, um, uh, you basically convert the utilities into probability functions. And then um, set, if you set that up right, then optimizing the free energy is, it can be expressed isomorphically to optimizing expected utility. 
Um, and the motivation for doing that is that now you can have kind of one algorithm to rule them all for in the brain and not have like separate decision and belief components. Right? And there, there's an empirical question to what extent that is actually an accurate description of how the brain works. Well, there is optimization in the, in the same sense that there's optimization here, which is that infer you know, the variational methods treat inference as an optimization problem, right? Yeah, so you can, so, but, but the thing is that if you, um, if you have a good approximation of the posterior, then that's the same as saying that you have optimized the divergence between your approximation and, your, and the true posterior, right? The, the, the difference algorith algorithmically is whether you write it down explicitly as an opti uh, optimization uh, uh, algorithm, right? So, so Monte Carlo algorithms usually are not interpreted as optimizing some divergence functional. Um, but, but it is the case that asymptotically they are optimizing that because asymptotically they'll converge to the true posterior and that's going to minimize the KL divergence. It's just that at each step of the sampler, they're not... Um, optimizing that the, the divergence. So that's the difference between um, Monte Carlo methods and these kinds of particle approximations, variational particle approximations, where the variational particle approximation is choosing the samples to minimize this divergence at each at each step of the algorithm, whereas um, most samplers are not doing that. Any other questions? All right. So, so. If we kind of take this at face value, the, the theory part, now we can talk a little bit about the uh, empirical evidence for this. And I, I think that this is the most compelling part of this whole, um, the, the, the whole set of claims here is, is the evidence for predictive coding. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is that um, there are a bunch of different variations on the idea of predictive coding out there. Not all of them are interpreted in this variational way. Um, so there's a classic paper by Rao and Ballard um, where they, they first developed some of these predictive, well, they didn't invent predictive coding, but they were the first to apply the idea of predictive coding to this hier cortical hierarchy. Um, and, um, but they were not, they were not uh, analyzing it as a variational approximation. That, came, that was mostly due to, to Carl Friston. Um, nonetheless, the same intuitions apply here, which is that... Um, uh, the, the, the basic kind of theme that we'll see here is that if you have a prediction uh, um, that, that predicts some pattern of data or, or at higher levels, some, some the, if, if you have a higher level prediction that, that um, anticipates some, some pattern of spiking at a higher level of the cortical hierarchy, then the um, predictions can basically suppress the evoked response. Um, so a classic example of this from Rowan Ballard is the end stopping effect. Um, so if you have a, a receptive field uh, in V1 that, that responds to line segments, um, if you extend the line beyond the receptive field, that uh, has the effect of suppressing the response uh, to, uh, to that uh, of that neuron to that um, line segment. And the way that Rao and Ballard explain this is that um, once you extend the line, now a, a higher level um, a, a, a higher level receptive field, like in V2, can detect a, li a, line, a longer line segment, a more visual structure, and can it basically explain away the, um, uh, explain away the, the, the smaller line segment. So in, in essence, the line, the line segment activates some higher level hypothesis, which then explains away the lower level hypothesis that, that there's just a small line segment in that se uh, section of the visual field, and um, that explains why you get this suppression of the, um, the response if, because the, according to this predictive coding idea, the V1 neurons, the feed forward pathways are only um, reporting the prediction error, not the prediction itself or the, or the stimulus itself. Uh, and one piece of evidence that they argue in favor of this interpretation is that it should depend on feedback. Uh, and there is evidence that if you inactivate the feedback pathway to V1, then um, you can get rid of this suppressive effect, this end stopping effect. Um, and they model that by basically removing the feedback pathways in their model. Um, so, so that's consistent with this general idea of predictive coding. There's a number of other examples that I'd like to go through. 
Um, so here's, here, this is one of my favorite examples, predictive coding of shape. So this was an fMRI study. And they, they were looking at the bold signal in both um, V1 and the lateral occipital com uh, complex, LOC. And they took the same set of line segments, um, but arranged them in different ways. Um, or actually, I can't remember actually if they're the same set of lines, but similar, similar arrangements of line segments, but, but the idea is that in one case, in the random case, you just kind of strew these little straws around so that they don't really, um, uh, they don't really uh, show a uh, coherent sh physical shape, or you can arrange them so that they show a coherent two-dimensional shape, or you can arrange them so that they show a coherent three-dimensional shape. Um, and what they found was that the bold signal in V1 was going down as you have more visual structure from random to 2D to 3D, and the LOC signal was going up. So this is, again, consistent with this idea that um, as you create more structure, the higher levels of cortex, like LOC, are, enc are encoding that structure, passing that prediction back down, and then suppressing the um, evoked response in lower level uh, um, regions that are reporting prediction errors. Um, this manifests in a number of different ways. So um, uh, one way that's been studied quite extensively is expectation suppression. Um, so here's an example um, from Chris Summerfield and, and Tobias Egner, um, where they were looking at um, the fusiform face area, an area that's selective uh, for faces, um, and looking at the effects of expectation on um, the signal in that area. So they, were, they had a paradigm in which um, faces or how, is it, how stimulus uh, stimuli would appear with some probability. Um, and so they were parametrically manipulating the, the degree of face expectation. And they found that the, um, the neural response to FFA was going down as the face expectation was going up. Um, uh, in contrast, um, the response to houses uh, was going up um, as face expectation was going up. And so this is all consistent with this idea that um, the FFA is responding not just to the bottom-up representation of faces, but to unexpected faces. Um, uh, you can also see this in repetition suppression. So repetition suppression is the widely observed phenomenon that if you present um, a stimulus repeatedly on subsequent presentations, the, the response is going to be lower. Uh, and, what, and what this study found was that um, repetition suppression is stronger when repetition is expected. So if you compare cases where stimuli were, were alternating or um, stimuli were repeating, um, you see a, a bigger repetition suppression effect um, um, when in the re repetition, com uh, repetition condition because now um, um, the, um, basically because of the same predictive coding idea that, that you're, gonna, um, you're gonna get stronger suppression with higher predictions. Um, one interesting twist in all of this is that um, we've been talking about the mean amplitude of the bold signal, but there's also information that's contained in the patterns of activity. So, and this turns out to, uh, these, these signals t turn out to carry different information. So um, it's true that expectation, as we've been talking about, suppresses bold responses in V1, um, but it also seems to increase classifier accuracy um, in that area. Um, if, if you train a classifier on the d patterns of activity in that area, you can read out things like orientation or, or contrast, um, and um, expectation increases the ability to uh, decode those variables, even though it suppresses the um, bold response, the mean amplitude. Uh, from V1, I believe, yeah, V1. V um, uh, so one. We've already seen how um, there's a distinction between feedback and feedforward pathways. Um, and um, we also know that these pathways have a um, distinct laminar structure. So, um, so uh, prediction errors, the feedforward pathways are uh, in the superficial layer of cortex, and the feedback pathways are in the deeper layer of cortex. So we'd predict that, um, that, that we would see um, uh, prediction error signals being preferentially signaled by the superficial layers of cortex, and then the predictions being uh, preferentially signaled by the feedback right, in the deep layers of cortex. And recently, there's been an exciting development in um, MRI technology where 
we can um, start to make statements about uh, the different lamina um, from fMRI data. Uh, and basically, this, this involves trying to unmix the contributions of different lamina to the bold signal. Uh, and you can, you can do this if you have a, a, an unmixing matrix. Um, in effect, deconvolve the, um, the laminar contributions to the bold signal. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the results of one study that looked at this, where um, they, they were looking at these Kinesia triangle stimuli. Um, so I'm sure all of you see this, uh, th that in the left stimulus, it looks like there's a triangle that's occluding these circles. Um, Whereas in the right stimulus, if you, if you basically break up that triangle, then it looks more like a bunch of Pac-Men that are oriented in different directions. So you don't see the, the um, occluder, even though the, the underlying segments are there, they've just been rearranged. Um, and um, the reason that they use these stimuli is because in the, in the left kinesis stimulus, uh, the idea is that you're gonna have a strong uh, prediction that there's some, um, surface at this region of the visual field, even though there's no actual contrast difference to indicate a, a surface there. It's all based on um, th th these essentially gestalt principles for inferring um, the, the occluding shape. Uh, and so what they found when they, when they now try to measure um, the different laminar uh, contributions to, uh, to this bold signal for these different stimuli, they were looking at, um, they, they, they broke this up based on whether a particular voxel had a, a receptive field centered on the illusory triangle or on one of the inducers. And what they found was that um, if you look at the regions with the receptive fields centered on the illusory triangle, um, you, you get um, a difference between the illusory figure and the no illusory figure, so the kinesia and the control stimulus um, in the deep uh, layers of cortex, which is consistent with this top, these top-down expectations, whereas if you look at the uh, voxels that have receptive fields centered on the inducer, you get um, uh, um, the opposite effect, so greater for uh, um, no illusory than illusory in the superficial layers, um, which, are, which are hypothesized to convey the bottom-up prediction error. So th this seems um, like pretty good provisional evidence for this pr predictive coding effect that you can see signatures of these feedback and fe feedback predictions and feed-forward prediction errors um, in the um, lamina as decoded by fMRI. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a super good question. You know, to be honest, I, I was trying to educate myself about the laminar fMRI as I was preparing this tutorial. And so I'm not, I'm not an expert on this at all. Maybe someone here can speak to that. I don't know. Sam, do you know anything about this? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I really don't know what the limits of the technology. It's, it's still pretty new, and people, are, I think, are developing better methods for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So why don't we keep going, unless there are other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the they have they're similar in the sense that there's prediction errors that are being coded, right? But but they're they're quite different in the sense that the the classical story about dopamine and temporal difference errors is that. Um, they're encoding errors in the value function, whereas um, here we're talking about errors in a in a network of beliefs. Right? So. Um, yeah. Well, so so Friston has an entirely different story about what dopamine is doing. Um, that um, that basically tonic dopamine signals aren't conveying this precision variable that that we were talking about. Um, the lambda term. Um, and he, so he, he doesn't really buy the idea at all that, that dopamine is conveying TD errors because he doesn't buy the idea that the brain is doing TD learning, right? The, the planning as inference idea subsumes TD learning into some other algorithm that, that's basically all about, basically the, he's trying to transform the problem of learning values into a problem of, um, of inference, into an inference problem, 
uh, optimizing free energy. So they, they, I, I guess the upshot is that they have some superficial similarities in the sense that they use prediction errors to, to do updating, but the, um, what, what the, the thing that they're updating is rather different. Okay. Um, um, so there is, a, there is a puzzle here, which is that, so, so far we've been talking about examples where predictive coding posits that neural responses uh, to expected stimuli should be suppressed. But at the same time, there are lots of studies that report increased neural responses to expected stimuli. So how can we resolve this tension? Um, and, and the answer, or one proposed answer, is that um, expectation and attention uh, may have some overlapping functionality, but, the, the, but um, there are really, at a computational level, two distinct things happening here. So one has to do with um, the, expect, the, the effects of expectation on the prediction errors. So expectations will suppress the prediction errors. But um, expectation can also have an effect on the precision. Um, and this requires us to have a, a, a little bit more um, principal distinction between expectation and attention. Um, so, so the argument from free energy, um, according to free energy theories, is that attention basically corresponds to precision. So when you're attending to some stimulus or some region of, of space, then you're going to increase your, your precision. Um, and, so, and that's going to have this kind of multiplicative or gain modulatory effect on the prediction errors. And uh, to, to make this a little bit more explicit, let's look at this diagram um, from this uh, book chapter by Peter Cook. Um, so the idea is as follows. So um, let's imagine that we have this uh, uh, predicted stimulus appearing or an unpredicted stimulus appearing. Um, so the prediction error is going to be bigger uh, for the unpredicted stimulus than for the predicted stimulus. Um, but we can also make this distinction between whether um, the um, stimulus was attended or not attended. So I imagine that I'm getting some attentional cue which tells me whether to pay attention to the, to the upcoming stimulus. Um, and I'm going to have higher precision when I'm paying attention and lower precision uh, when I'm not paying attention. Um, and then when you multiply these two things together according to the predictive coding idea, um, then you get this precision weighted prediction error and you see this interaction effect emerge. So. Um, for unattended stimuli, uh, you get, someone really doesn't like attention and precision. <laughs> but um, uh, so for unattended stimuli, you get higher responses for unpredicted than uh, predicted stimuli. And that, that's, that's basically the, the standard predictive coding story. But if you're attending, then you can get higher um, uh, responses, high, uh, higher precision weighted prediction errors for predicted than for unpredicted stimuli. So it, the pattern basically reverses itself. Um, and this was studied in, in the following way. So imagine, so, so there's a task where um, you get a prediction cue which says, um, which tells you the likely position where a uh, stimulus is going to appear. And then you, in addition, get an attention cue uh, which tells you um, whether to pay attention to the stimulus in a particular location. Um, so you can, for example, get stimuli that are attended but unpredicted. Um, or stimuli that are predicted but unattended. Right? Um, and when you do this, uh, you can see this, this um, crossover interaction uh, in, the, in the bold signal amplitude uh, in V1. Um, so you see that when it's unattended, you get bigger responses for unpredicted than for predicted stimuli, and then this flips around uh, for attention, consistent with that uh, uh, simulation of attention-weighted uh, prediction errors that I showed you before. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Um, now, I've been a little bit vague about how exactly attention affects precision. So there, there's, broadly speaking, there's two ways you could do this. There are two ways that you can increase signal-to-noise ratio, so you can reduce noise or increase signal. Um, and there's some evidence for both of these possibilities. So, so for example, um, uh, across, if you look across subjects, in one, there, there's one study um, where they looked at um, the, um, the, amplitude, the mean amplitude of the bold signal in V1 and related that to uh, a performance measure and showed that um, individuals with higher amplitude bold signals um, showed greater performance on a psychophysical task. So that would be consistent with this signal amplification interpretation. Um, 
And then there's another possibility is that there's a noise suppression interpretation, which is consistent with some electrophysiology data from Cohen and Mansell, um, where they, sh they found that um, the variance was lower um, for stimuli that, that were attended compared to stimuli that were unattended. So these are two possibilities, and, and they're not mutually exclusive. So you could have lower variance and higher signal um, to produce these attention modulations. All right, so to, to summarize the, the stories this far, um, um, variational inference offers a path for scalable algorithms. Um, and if you look in the machine learning literature, there's um, there's been a trend sort of away from Monte Carlo methods, which are often considered to be too slow, towards variational methods, um, and even towards uh, what are called amortized variational methods, which I'm going to talk about a little later. So familiar algorithms like the variational autoencoder basically run on those kinds of, um, those kinds of uh, approximations. Um, now, the, the predictive coding analysis shows that you can implement um, variational inference in a neuro neurobiologically plausible circuit. Um, but just keep in mind that this requires a bunch of assumptions. Um, so if those assumptions break, like for example, if you can't impose a Gaussian assumption, then you have to do something else. Um, uh, now, th there's a challenge here. So what is the psychological evidence for, for any of this? Um, one of the problems is that if we can't impose any constraints on the variational family, it's virtually unfalsifiable. And we already sort of saw this in a few examples. Um, like, um, so the, the predictive coding framework imposes some very strong uh, assumptions, and that's what makes it a falsifiable claim about neural activity. Um, but it's a little bit less clear what kind of falsifiable claims we can make about uh, human behavior uh, on the basis of those assumptions. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to try to give you two examples, which I think maybe make the case for um, psychological uh, evidence in favor of uh, variational approximation. So the first has to do with order effects and factorized approximations, and the second has to do with um, kind of mental graph surgery and causal inference. All right. So um, many of you may be familiar with um, blocking effects. I'm using this notation where A and B correspond to Qs, and the plus and minus is, correspond to rewards or, or absences of rewards. Um, so the forward blocking paradigm works as follows. So I present a Q with reward. And I do that a bunch of times. And then in the second phase, I present that, that same Q, but in compound with a novel Q, B. And I also reward uh, that compound. And then I test with, um, with that novel uh, Q. So I want to see how much, um, uh, how much association with the reward has been acquired for that novel Q. And I compare that to a case where the novel Q was, got the same uh, amount of reinforcement, but um, was, not, was never uh, reinforced in compound with A. Uh, and in general, what you find is that you get more response to, uh, more reward expectation for B when it was trained by itself compared to when it was trained in compound with a re uh, another Q that was already reward predictive. And there's a, there's a classical explanation of this that comes from the Rescorla Wagner model. And the idea is that you use prediction errors to update your estimates. And those prediction errors are basically um, distributed among all the Qs. So that's the principle of Q competition. Uh, so in the first phase, you learn that A predicts reward. And now in the second phase, um, because the, the assumption is that the, um, the reward expectations for A and B summate to produce the expectation for that compound, and since A already perfectly predicts the reward, there's no prediction error. The reward is totally expected. And so there's no um, updating of, of B's uh, associ um, associative strength beyond zero. And that's why you get this blocking effect. Um, unfortunately, that explanation doesn't work for backward blocking, which is just the same thing, except we reverse the order of the phases. So now we first reinforce A, B, and compound, and then we reinforce A by itself. Um, and then again, you see that the, um, the response to B reinforced by itself is, is um, stronger than the, the response um, to B reinforced in compound. Um, so the, the error-driven the, the, um, error updating idea no longer works here. Um, because um, B is not even present during the second phase. So how can anything be learned about B if B is not even present? Um, um, models like the Rescorla Wagner model require that um, you can only, they assume that learning can only happen for Qs that are present, not for absent Qs. And that kind of inspired a bunch of ad hoc modifications of the Rescorla Wagner model um, to accommodate that. Like, you know, introduction of absent learning for absent cues, but with the sign flipped. But it was all quite ad hoc. 
Um, there's another important uh, constraint. I'll, I'll shortly explain how to explain both forward and backward blocking, but there, there's, a, there's another important constraint, which is that forward blocking is reliably stronger than backward blocking. Um, so how can we explain that? Um, so to start to explain just the forward and, black, uh, forward and backward blocking phenomenon by themselves, let's think about this as an estimation problem. So think about this rat in the classical conditioning context. And the rat has the following linear Gaussian generative model of the world that assumes that the reward or punishments, as, it, as it, the case may be, arise from a linear combination of the available cues plus some Gaussian noise. Um, and so those, the, the weights on that linear combination, the x denotes q's and the, and the uh, w denotes the weights, those weights are basically a measure of the associative strength to some q. Um, and then the inference problem is to basically invert this generative model and infer the posterior over, over w conditional on the history of q's and outcomes. Um, and if you make this, these linear Gaussian assumptions, then the posterior is also going to be Gaussian, uh, and you can parameterize it by some mean and covariance. Um, and it turns out that you can actually update these parameters recursively, so trial by trial, um, and you can do this uh, analytically using the Kalman filter, so a classic tool from signal processing. Um, and what's neat about this is that the Kalman filter looks a lot like the squirrel wagner model in the sense that the, the weights are updated in proportion to the prediction errors, um, but one thing that happens is that you get uh, this extra kind of, the, the learning rates are now endogenized into the model, and they depend on the covariance structure. Um, and so the critical novelty here is that um, you can allocate uh, credit or blame to cues that are absent, provided that they have some positive or negative covariance with present cues. And we're going to use that to um, explain backward blocking. But first, let, the, the explanation of forward blocking is essentially the same as the explanation for, uh, in the Rescorla Wagner model, that there's no prediction error on those, um, on those compound trials, and so there's no updating. Um, so how do we think about backward blocking? So let's look at this um, graphically. So let's imagine that you start with a prior over weights that's isotropic and Gaussian. So that's shown on the left. And then your likelihood function encodes the fact that um, th there's basically a constraint line. So if you get a single unit of reward, um, then the, Q, the two Qs have to summate to produce that single unit of reward. So the weights on those Qs can never, uh, always have to add up to one. And that's what the constraint line basically visualizes graphically. But there's this kind of blurry um, uh, boundary around the, the constraint line because there's noise in the observation. So you don't need to exactly satisfy the constraint. You have to just be near the constraint line. So According to Bayes' rule, we can get the posterior by just multiplying these two things together and renormalizing, and you get this posterior, which is kind of this warped ellipse around the, around the constraint line. Uh, and the important implication here is that this is a Gaussian with negative covariance between the Qs. What that means is that when one Q goes up, uh, when the, weight, the associative weight of one Q goes up, the, the associative weight of the other Q has to go down. Uh, and that's in order to satisfy approximately the, the, this constraint line. Um, and that's what explains backward blocking, because if we go back to this, um, this blocking, the backward blocking experiment, uh, so during the compound Q phase, you learn that there's this negative covariance between the Qs, and then in the, when you reward A by itself, um, you're not only increasing the weight for A, but you're also decreasing the weight for B because of this uh, negative covariance. And that produces backward blocking. Um, now, the problem, though, is that this doesn't explain the asymmetry between forward and backward blocking. Why is forward blocking stronger than backward blocking? Um, and so um, this is where the variational ideas come into play. Um, so remember, the, the covariance terms are critical for explaining backward blocking. Um, if we assume that the posterior factorizes, then backward blocking goes away completely. Is that clear to everyone? Uh, because the factorization means that you can't, by definition, you can't represent the covariance structure. Um, uh, but forward blocking doesn't depend on, um, uh, uh, forward blocking doesn't depend on um, the covariance terms at all, right? All it requires is the fact that you don't get, uh, you, you don't get positive prediction errors when the Qs are reinforced in compound. Um, now, this is not entirely satisfactory because why is it that you get some backward blocking so there is a backward blocking effect. It's just not as strong as the forward blocking effect. 
Um, so there's a way actually to, uh, to get partial backward blocking. This was an idea that was developed by Nathaniel Daw and uh, Aaron Corville, um, where you assume that the covariance matrix is reduced rank. Um, so in effect, you're, you're restricting its ability to represent the full distribution, the full posterior covariance, um, but it can sort of partially represent, partially capture some of the covariance structure. And that if, what, what that does in effect is downweights the covariance terms. And that's, that's illustrated in the simulation here. So um, you, get, you get the forward and backward blocking effects, but the backward blocking effect is much weaker um, than the forward blocking effect. Um, so there's an interesting neural circuit view to this, um, which, is, um, which was thought out by uh, Sham Kakade and Peter Dayan. Um, where you can interpret the common filter, you can interpret the, you can implement the common filter in, the, in a particular kind of um, neural network where the sensory cortex. Uh, I'm giving kind of a neurobiological gloss on this that, that wasn't in the original paper, but let's imagine that that cortex is uh, conveying the cues, um, and then there's a there's a downstream region um, with recurrence that um, effectively implements a kind of whitening transform. So if, when you run these recurrent um, uh, dynamics, you'll, you're going to extract um, a new representation of the stimuli, of the cues, um, um, that are eff effectively constitute a kind of orthogonal basis. And then what you can do is do normal associative learning, so sort of vanilla associative learning between uh, this um, transformed representation and the outcomes. Um, so, so it's an interesting division of labor where you have this kind of re-representation step um, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a basic associative learning step. And, that, and when you put those two things together, you can get, um, uh, you can implement the common filter using that machinery. Um, now, that's assuming that, that, that it can perfectly implement the common filter if you assume that there's the same number of units in the hidden layer as there are in the input layer. So every cue gets its own kind of unique re-representation in this hidden layer. Um, but if you restricted the dimensionality of the hidden layer, or if you put some regularizer so that it, it, it was limited in, in, its, in, in its expressivity, then it would no longer be able to represent the full uh, posterior covariance. And that's, in effect, a way to um, implement this kind of reduced rank transformation. So you, you, you constrain the representational flexibility of this hidden layer. Um, and that's, that's what I'm showing here. OK. Um, now this is all conjectural. There's no, there's no direct evidence that this is what's happening in backward blocking. Unfortunately, there's very, actually very few studies of backward blocking in animals. Um, so this is kind of an open question whether this is a good story or not. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Well, can you, can you elaborate a little bit? The question was about mutual information. Um, but what about mutual information? Uh, the mutual information that the AQ to have. Right. Well, the covariance is expressing mutual information. I mean, that, that's, there's, there's going to be a correspondence between the covariance between Qs and their mutual information. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we can, we can talk about it more later if you want. Um, all right, so if, um, so if everyone, if no, there are no other questions about this part, I'm going to talk about the causal graph surgery as another case study in um, how the variational approximations might come into play in, approximate, um, in, in, in psych explaining psychological phenomena. Um, so here the idea is that if you have some, if I give you some causal network and you have to make some inferences about that network, um, doing exact inferences in that network might be very difficult, but it might be easier if I could basically do some surgery on the graph, like cut some of the connections or delete some of the variables, um, so that now I'm doing inference in a simpler graph. Um, and then we can ask the question, which is in essence a variational question, um, which simplified graph is um, closest with, from, uh, drawn from some, some restricted family of simplifications closest in KL divergence to the true posterior uh, over the graphs. Um, and Thomas Eichhardt and, and Noah Goodman have used this idea to explain a number of um, 
seemingly irrational behaviors in, in the causal inference literature. So I'll give you an example, which is uh, neglect of alternative causes. So there's an empirical finding, which is that uh, you neglect alternative causes um, more um, in predictive inference tasks uh, compared to diagnostic inference tasks. So, so the difference in, between predictive and, and diagnostic inference tasks is illustrated here. Um, you, have, um, uh, you have the same set of variables, but in the predictive inference task, you're trying to reason from cause to effect, and in diagnostic inference tasks, you're trying to re reason from effect to cause. All right, so why is it that um, people seem to neglect alternative causes more in predictive inference tasks? So what Eichert and Goodman showed was that um, the submodel in which, which A is ignored, so if you have this alternative cause, uh, if you ignore that alternative cause, um, that doesn't have as bad of an effect on your inferences um, in the predictive inference task compared to the diagnostic inference task. In the di diagnostic inference task, you could do catastrophically bad if you ignored the alternative cause, but you could still predict pretty well if you ignored the alternative cause. Um, and they quantified this in terms of the, the Kale divergence. Uh, and so this is one idea about, um, this is one example of where you could take ideas about um, uh, variational inference and show that, that um, people might be adopting certain restrictions on their variational family. Now, I don't want to get into the details of this, but I thought it's worth mentioning, which is that there's a, there's a world beyond free energy. I know that that sounds heretical. <laughs> um, so the, the Kale divergence is only one possible measure of divergence between the true posterior and its approximation. There's, there's a wider family, which is uh, known as the alpha divergence family. Um, and remember that you know, I'm kind of going back and forth between talking about free energy minimization and Kale minimization because, the, the, in essence, they're doing the same thing in variational inference. Um, so it, the, understanding this equation is not important. That what, what's more interesting is the kind of special cases of these alpha divergences. So you can get free energy minimization uh, when alpha goes to zero, um, but you can also get other things. So you can get um, other kinds of algorithms like uh, expectation propagation and assumed density filtering when alpha goes to one, um, and there are other sort of lesser known things. Um, but, but what's interesting is that these have qualitatively different behaviors. So, um, so free energy minimization tends to um, um, try to capture the modes of the distributions, even if, even if it means ignoring, it captures sort of the, the, the mode with the highest probability mass, even if it means ignoring some of the other modes, whereas algorithms like expectation propagation um, try to cover um, cover as many modes as they can with a single distribution. So that, that's what's shown on the right, where you kind of stretch your approximate posterior over a bunch of different modes as opposed to squash it onto a single mode. Um, and you can make a kind of more general characterization of this with respect to this alpha parameter. Um, so the, the critical difference has to do with zero forcing versus inclusive, uh, zero avoiding behavior. So um, when alpha is less than zero, you get zero forcing behavior, which means that when the probability distribution, the true probability is zero, it forces the approximate probability to be zero. Um, and this is going to keep um, the areas of largest total, uh, that, that, that means that the approximate posterior is going to be forced to um, keep the areas of largest total mass so that you'll get this kind of mode seeking behavior. Um, whereas when alpha is greater than one, um, you, the approximation will stretch to capture all the modes. So this is a kind of zero avoiding behavior. Um, who knows whether any of these uh, divergence functionals are, are relevant for neural computation or psychology, but I think it's important to, to know about some of these things. Um, so for example, like, you know, Zach has stuff on tree-weighted belief propagation. So that's a, that's a different alpha divergence from, uh, you know, the kinds of mean field approximations that, that are often applied to neuroscience. And so we should keep in mind that, th that, there's, that, that these are actually, you know, qualitatively different options here. Any thoughts or questions about this so far? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess I should first start by saying that we should distinguish between applications of mean field approximations to 
analyzing neural systems as opposed to modeling neural systems. So what I mean by that is, you know, the, the classical application of mean field approximations to computational neuroscience was taking some complex joint distribution over neural activities and then uh, imposing the mean field approximation. So it's not that the neural circuit itself is, is implementing the mean field approximation. We're, ju we're just using that as an analytical tool to make some characterizations of that neural circuit, right? So that's purely a data analysis tool. Um, and I'd, I'd say that's much more common than the actual, actually using the mean field assumption in the model of the neural system, um, which there's, you know, not that many people have, have done that. But I, th I guess, generally speaking, people have always liked the mean field approximation because it's simpler. <laughs> it's easier to implement. It's, it's often broadly applicable. So, like, you can implement mean field approximations for basically for most exponential family distributions. Um, so it's always been kind of a workhorse of variational inference. Um, and, and there's other issues here, which is that, um, uh, that uh, have to do with convergence guarantees and things like that. Like, um, like um, the, when you run the mean field approximation, you're guaranteed to, to reach a local optimum uh, of the variational free energy. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, that's not true of expectation propagation, but I, I may be misremembering that. Um, yeah. But I, I, think, I think, so anyway, I just wanted to open your, your minds to these alternative possibilities without trying to uh, advocate for any one of them. All right, so, so this kind of raises a bunch of questions and, and we can, if you guys would like, we can spend some time discussing these. Um, um, so what divergence is the brain optimizing? How can we even know? Um, you know what, what kind of approximation family is the brain using? So even once you commit to the divergence functional, what, 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 um, what family is the brain using? Um, is there one divergence or maybe, the, um, or, or approximation family, or does the brain use a bunch of different ones? Um, is there generic optimization uh, machinery that's being applied to all inference problems, or do we have specialized inference machinery for a particular problems? So for example, I already said before that um, you need to make these Gaussian assumptions uh, and gradient descent in this continuous parameter space to, to make um, like the classical predictive coding schemes work. Um, but maybe you need other things to, uh, other, other assumptions um, to make them work for other kinds of variables, like discrete variables. Um, and then um, another important question to think about is um, what kinds of constraints do probabilistic approximations place on generative models? Uh, what I mean by that is I could dream up some super complicated generative model, but if inference is intractable in that generative model, uh, then what good is that to me, right? I, you know, really I want to only think about generative models where I can actually do uh, tractable inference. Um, and, and even in the cases where I try to do, you know, quasi-tractable inference, you know, approximate inference in some complex generative model, my inferences might not line up very well with the true posterior for that generative model. So I may, I may end up having a pretty stark mismatch um, between my inferences and the true posterior. Um, so that might, add, that might mean that the brain selects generative models that are somehow matched to its approximation machinery. So I don't know if any of you guys have any thoughts about that. Zach? Um, I don't know. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess it depends. Maybe. Maybe you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. I think it's just so hard to make a general statement about that, but I think you could probably prove that certain combinations are distinguishable. Um, I feel like, I don't know if Weiji is still here. I, feel, I think he was doing some experiments trying to do something like that. But, uh, the, the, the question behind yeah. that is, is it meaningful to ask whether the brain has a generative model that is performing I mean, I still think it's, yeah, I, I still think it's meaningful to, because how do we talk, how do we even talk about approximate inference or inference at all if we don't know what kind of generative model we're assuming? I mean, then we may as well just abandon this whole perspective, right? Because um, we just, there's no way to derive ex ante predictions about inference if we don't start with a generative model. Yeah. 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 
models? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 And it, yeah, no, no, I think that's, that's a super interesting possibility. Um, and I guess, I guess I don't know how else to deal with that except on a kind of case-by-case -case basis. Like someone should say, I think the brain is doing this generative model and this inference, and then we'll try to come up with some alternatives that maybe, and maybe we'll find out that it's not identifiable in the end. Anybody else? Yeah. The TD learning is not? Why, why not? Um, I mean, there's a, I mean, it, sorry, you're trying to minimize, the, you know, there's a, there's a Bellman optimality equation that you're trying to satisfy, right? Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah. But you're, so, sorry, so say again what, um, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, no, I think that, that, that always seemed very plausible to me that you could have this kind of society of mind where you have a bunch of different systems um, trying to do their own thing, and then there's not necessarily a unified cost function. I mean, at some level, if you believe in evolution, there has to be a unified cost function, which is fitness. But... Um, but at the level of the organism, the, the optimization that's being performed in the single organism, there might not be. Yeah. 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 What, what do you want to do with variational inequalities? Well, just, I mean, so we can yeah. bring uh, any sort of magical stuff in this perspective and optimize it for problems in the world, right? So maybe this is some more general framework that mm. we can bring all of these things. Yeah. Like <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you, you can read Carl Friston, right? Like, he, he's trying to put everything into this framework, right? So, um, so you can judge for yourself whether he succeeds. All right, so one, yeah. 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 Well, sorry, well, the, I think the predictive coding is the most plausible example of that, right? That, that's a, that's a, a biologically plausible architecture for implementing. Um, you mean like can we can we reverse engineer the constraints on the variational family from some biophysical constraints? Um, maybe. I mean, I think that I think that Carl Friston has tried to do things of that sort, um, and and there's certainly some. There, there's a paper by Andre Bastos uh, about how you can use cortical um, uh, canonical microcircuits to uh, implement various predictive coding schemes and. So, so there, there, there's stuff like that. I don't know how strong uh, reverse inference you can make from that, but I don't know. Was there a comment over here that you wanted to jump in? Uh, yeah. Kind of post, uh, my hands are not close to the I'm Andre. Oh, you're Andre, OK. So, all right, so talk to Andre. He, he seems to have the answer. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, that's, that's interesting to know. Yeah. Sorry, so it's, it's the... Yes, among other things. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. So I, I would imagine, yes, I think that's true. So, so one thing that I always wanted to do was like variational signal detection theory. Basically, you know, sig most of signal detection theory is based on Gaussian assumptions. 
um, so what happens if we have some non-Gaussian distribution, like a heavy tail distribution, but then we, we assume that you're doing signal detection theory with Laplace approximation, so you're basically trying to fit a Gaussian to this non-Gaussian thing. So you're going to have some systematic biases relative to the ideal observer. So I think that that, that could be done, I, and I'm not aware of anyone having done that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, well, one trick with mixture of Gaussians is that you can have a kind of a auxiliary variable set up where you condition on the mixture component. So you, you sample the mixture assignments, and then everything is Gaussian, conditionally Gaussian, right? So then you can kind of get around that. But I don't know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that in the, specifically in the context of predictive coding. I know maybe someone else does. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I, but so so actually, I, years ago I wrote a paper that derives um, variational inference from mixture of Gaussian approximations. So if you're interested, that was that was a machine learning paper. Um, we didn't make any claims about the brain, but that but so you have it, it's not entirely trivial, right? So you have to. You have to make you have to make some additional approximations to to um, make that op optimization problem tractable. Uh, it's called non-parametric variational inference. If you're interested. Um, all right. So why don't we keep going? Okay. Great. Um, so let's go to um, move on to amortized inference, which to me I think is kind of the most exciting direction here. Um, so. Most of the approximations we've been talking about, most of the approximations studied in, in psychology and neuroscience are, are memoryless. Um, what that means is that if I ask you to solve like a sequence of inference problems, um, your solution to one inference problem will have no effect on your solution to the next inference problem. You're solving each of them de novo. Um, and this is obviously wasteful because there could be significant shared structure across inferences and it's not being exploited. Um, so how can we formalize sharing of structure across inferences? Um, so one way to think about this in the variational framework is that we're going to, instead of modeling a separate variational posterior for each data set, we're going to model a mapping from data to, to um, posteriors. So I'm now, I'm now writing this explicitly as Q of S given D. Um, and now, now there's an additional thing here, which is this expectation under P tilde of the KL divergence. So what is that? So P tilde is... The, what we're calling the query distribution over the data. Um, so this is the distribution over data that data sets that you're going to be exposed to, the, some stream of data sets. Um, and the idea here is that you want to optimize this mapping from data to posterior uh, that minimizes the KL divergence on average with respect to the query distribution. So the intuition here is that um, if you, assuming that this variational approximation has some limited uh, capacity, you want to concentrate the uh, approximation resources on regions of, of the data distribution that have high probability under the query distribution. Okay. So an example is shown here. So I'm sure on the x-axis is the prior and the y-axis is the, the likelihood. And so this is a particular joint distribution. And then, and then that contour plot superimposed on it is the query distribution. And so um, uh, what's shown in the middle is the result of running this, um, of optimizing that expected KL, um, uh, of solving that expected KL optimization problem, where now you get a good approximation of the posterior primarily in the regions of high query probability. And outside that region, you um, basically say, whatever, I'm not going to care about those regions because I don't see them very often, right? Um, so, and so, so I'm, I'm concentrating regions, uh, resources on regions of high probability and ignoring the regions of low probability. Um, and one consequence of this is that if the, depending on how you structure that mapping, if there's some kind of convergence of that map, so shared parameters across the, uh, across the different posteriors, then you're going to have a kind of learning to infer effect, which is that um, solving one inference problem is going to bleed into your solution to the next inference problem. Um, so we can make this a little bit more concrete. Let's imagine a particular neural network that's implementing this uh, mapping from data to posterior. So you get a query 
the query includes the data set itself and the question you're being asked about the data. Um, and then that gets passed through some hidden layer, some computational bottleneck, and then, and then outputs the output, which is some sufficient statistics of the posterior. So how we're, however we choose to represent the approximate posterior. Um, so the implications, the first one I already mentioned, people are gonna learn to infer. So even when you know all aspects of the generative model, um, so there's no learning about the distribution itself, judgments are adapted to the query distribution. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk in a moment about experiments where we think that people aren't actually learning about the world, they're learning about their internal inference machinery. So they're learning how to infer. And then the other important implication is that uh, inference is not memoryless, so early, influence, early inferences influence later ones. Um, and people should learn to ignore their priors uh, when they're uninformative, so a high signal-to-noise ratio under the query distribution, and, and, but also to ignore their likelihoods when the signal-to-noise ratio is low. In other words, they, they can adaptively pay attention to different parts of the posterior calculation, like the likelihood or the prior. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they have some explicit representation of the weighting of likelihood and prior. It could all happen in this kind of hidden layer of the neural network emergently. Um, so a little bit of background. So the idea of amortized inference is not actually new. Um, you know, the classic example of this was the Helmholtz machine that was developed in the 1990s by Peter Diane and Jeff Hinton and others. Um, and so on the surface, it looks just like a neural network, right? Uh, but the critical thing is that it's simultaneously a generative model and a recognition model that is an uh, and they use the term recognition model to denote this um, amortized posterior. So the model, um, generates data from the sigmoid uh, belief network, and then it also tries to optimize a, a, a neural network going the opposite direction that does inference in that generative model. Um, and the same idea has been kind of updated and modernized um, uh, for, for applications to a bunch of different models, most famously the variational autoencoder, which is a form of amortized inference. So um, you can interpret the encoder as an approximate posterior, where the, the hidden layer represents um, samples from this belief distribution, the approximate belief distribution, and then the decoder corresponds to the generative model. And so these two things work in tandem to optimize this amortized uh, objective function. So from a psychological pr perspective, we're interested in the question, do people learn to infer? Can we show evidence that people are sensitive to um, the, the, the um, the query distribution in making their inferences. So, so the, kind of the first step in this direction um, was um, I reanalyzed some data uh, that I had collected a few years ago from, from, for a different purpose um, where subjects were showing, uh, were doing this very simple task, so they had to predict the next number that appears. And um, the numbers were drawn from a Gaussian distribution with some mean that they didn't know. Um, and importantly, across blocks, the mean of, that, of each block was drawn from some other Gaussian distribution. So it's a hierarchical Gaussian model. Um, and I had two different conditions, one where the means across these blocks were, were um, very tightly clustered together, and one where they were more dispersed, so low dispersion and high dispersion. Um, and um, the, 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 in this context, the interesting question here is if subjects are learning to infer that they should tend to overreact, so they should learn to ignore their prior in the high dispersion condition and do that more relative to the low dispersion condition. Because essentially, in the high dispersion condition, the, the, this, this hierarchical prior doesn't provide as much information about, about the number prediction, so they should basically learn to ignore that prior relative to what an ideal observer would do. So what I'm showing you here is that the, on the y-axis is the empirical data, so how much do people update their predictions from trial to trial? Um, and then on the x-axis is the ideal observer, so the optimal Bayesian, hierarchical Bayesian model. And what you see is that there's this characteristic pattern where in the high dispersion condition, people seem to systematically overreact to the data. So they seem to be updating more than they should compared to the low dispersion condition. Um, if they were being ideal Bayesians, they would lie along this diagonal line. Um, so that's one first clue that people might be learning to infer, but the part of the problem here is that it's a little bit unclear whether people might have also been learning about the generative model at the same time that they might be learning to infer. So we wanted a cleaner test of this. So we went back to a kind of a classic workhorse of, um, of experimental psychology, where, which are these ball and urn paradigms. So the idea here is that I'm going to draw one of these urns. Uh, so I show you these two urns that have different compositions of blue and red balls. And I'm going to draw one of these urns with some 
probability. Those are the base rates of the urns. And I show this to you in this kind of wheel of fortune thing. Um, and then I'm going to draw um, one marble from, uh, one ball from the, one, the urn that I selected and show it to you. So you only get to see the, the, the color of the ball that I selected. And you have to infer the posterior probability of, over the urns. Um, so what, what, is, what is the probability that, uh, that the urn came from the left, uh, the ball came from the left or the right urn? Um, so it's important to emphasize that everything you need to know about the joint distribution is given to you here, right? So there's no learning about the world. The world is, you have it all very explicit for you, right? Um, so, um, but what we're, we're, one thing we're going to do here is from trial to trial, we're going to give you a whole bunch of these different uh, problems. And in some conditions, we're going to vary, the, hold the likelihood constant across trials and vary the prior. In other cases, we're going to hold the, like, the prior constant and vary the likelihood. So it looks like this. Um, and the reason we're doing this is we wanted to show that even though you have all the information available that you need to be an ideal Bayesian, um, you're going to tend to ignore um, the prior when the prior is not variable and ignore the likelihood when the likelihood is not variable. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what, what um, people do. Uh, it shows that basically people uh, learn to infer in the sense that they can, um, uh, they can pay more differential attention to the more informative source of information based on their query distribution. Um, uh, and it turns out that this can, can explain a pretty broad range of phenomena. Um, there are many documented deviations from, from Bayesian updating. So um, in general, for these kinds of ball and urn problems, you see that people consistently update in the direction prescribed by Bayes' rule, but they, don't, they sometimes seem to update too much and sometimes too little. Um, and there's evidence for this actually in real financial markets. So um, our claim here is that amortized inference can explain some of these deviations. Um, and one, one clue from the old um, uh, psychology literature is that if you look at... Um, People, uh, people's responses relative to um, the ideal Bayesian response, they seem to be better calibrated around odds, uh, log odds of zero. Um, and then once you get to more extreme log odds, either in favor or against some hypothesis, people seem to get systematically miscalibrated. And there is an ecological uh, explanation for this in terms of the query distribution. So if you look at those query distributions, um, the... Um, uh, they, they tend to be centered around zero. In other words, the query distribution is centered around exactly the place where people are best, are most calibrated, right? And so, so we don't think that's a, a coincidence. Uh, we think that's because of learning to infer. Um, it turns out that you can also get these kinds of memory-based spillover effects in the subadditivity and superadditivity examples that I showed you before. So we've we've done experiments where we took the same basic paradigm that I showed you before, where people are told about some Q object, like a table, and then they have to um, rate the probability that um, some subset of other objects is um, present in the image. But what we do is we actually get, uh, organize these trials into pairs. So they do the pairs of trials. Um, and we're looking at subadditive and superadditive effects on the second trial as a function of unpacking in the first trial. Right? So if people, if, if people were memoryless, then it d wouldn't matter what you did on the first trial. There would be no spillover into the second trial. Um, but we, w we predicted that um, depending on whether you have an atypical or typical unpacking in the, in the first trial, that's going to translate into a subadditive or superadditive effect in the second trial. And in fact, that's exactly what we found. Um, um, and um, in fact, you can take that one step further and show that um, that it's sensitive to the similarity of cues. So it's not just that there's arbitrary spillover from one trial to the next. Um, it depends on the similarity of cues between those, those two inferences. So you only are going to transfer information from one inference problem to another um, if those inference problems are similar. Um, like basically their queries are similar. Um, and that's again consistent with this kind of amortization framework. Um, another intriguing phenomena that this could potentially explain is belief bias. So um, if you had this um, perfectly generic probabilistic inference machinery in your heads, then I could give you any numbers of priors of likely and likelihoods, and you should be able to crunch those numbers and give me back um, um, an inference. And even if that's an approximate inference machi um, uh, machinery, it, it probably, it shouldn't, um, you know, the, the version of the story that I've been giving you before is that it doesn't matter what numbers you put into it, it, um, it, whether those numbers are plausible or implausible, it should just, 
run its approximation and give you an answer. Um, but it turns out that, that it does matter for people. So um, if you give people implausible numbers, then they seem to be worse, the, the, uh, more poorly calibrated with the ideal Bayesian answer than if you give them plausible numbers. So if I told you, like, um, here's a medical test for, um, uh, for HIV. The base rate for HIV is 99% in the population, and the medical test has an accuracy of 2%, right? So that's a very implausible set of numbers if you're talking to a doctor in the Western world. And, um, and so, the, so, so, the, the, so the, the finding here, the experimental finding, is that when you give people these kinds of implausible numbers, they're not as good at being, they're not as good Bayesians as they would be if you give them plausible numbers, like a base rate of 1% and accuracy of 90%. Um, and we could explain this um, by, in terms of learning to infer, um, because remember, people are optimizing their mapping, their, their approximate posterior, they're, they're optimizing it for a particular query distribution. That is the query distribution that they're exposed to in, their, in the natural world. And if you give them weird queries, they're not going to be optimized for that. They haven't allocated cognitive resources to being able to answer um, quer queries outside of their query distribution. Yeah. 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 That's a great question. So the question was about whether this is motivation dependent, and um, so the assumption here is that you have limited cognitive resources. Because if you had infinite cognitive resources, then you could just perfectly represent all posteriors, right? Um, now there's an open question, which is that can I, if I'm sufficiently motivated, can I increase my availability of resources? and therefore get better approximations um, and not be quite as restricted to the particular query distribution that I'm showing. Um, so the prediction would be that if you could motivate someone sufficiently, some of these effects would go away. Um, but I, I'm not aware of studies that systematically look at that. Um, there's one other um, perspective on, on amortization that I wanted to bring up, which is a regularization perspective. Um, so it, suppose that we're getting this sequence of, of, of queries, uh, and I'm looking at one particular query. I can break down the optimization problem into um, minimizing the KL divergence for that particular query, plus a regularization term that depends on all the other queries, or rather the expected KL under this query distribution. Um, and the implication here is that if the focal query is high probability, then the second term counts less. That, that comes from this one over p of d term. Um, so if I get a really high, if I get a query that's really high probability under the query distribution, then I'm going to ignore this regularizer, and I'm just going to try to fit my um, approximation to that to that particular query. But if it's very low probability under the query distribution, then I'm basically going to ignore that query and just pull my approximation towards the 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 approximation that fits the rest of my query distribution. Um, so, so there's a kind of adaptive regularization here that's, that, um, that makes intuitive sense. Um, and we can, we can think about this almost as a kind of meta-Bayesian inference. So um, when I have an approximate posterior, um, I have uncertainty about what the posterior should be given the data that I've observed. Um, and that's what the, this regularization perspective is saying, is that, I, that given my uncertainty, I want to pull my estimates towards the distribution of, of, of posteriors that I, that I commonly confront. Um, and this can explain, for example, why probability estimates tend to be biased towards the mean of the query distribution. Um, this is sometimes called conservatism. Um, uh, and it, and it, 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 it's consistent with this idea that um, you know, on the tails of, in the tails of the distribution, you're more, um, you have a greater degree of uncertainty. Um, and so you should have strong, um, stronger regularization around the, in the tails of the distribution. Uh, and it turns out that it actually makes another prediction, which is that the variance of the um, judgments are going to be higher in around the mean of the query distribution because of the, essentially because of this bias variance trade-off. So you have stronger bias um, in the tails of the distribution and lower variance, but you have weaker bias in the mean of the distribution and, and higher variance. And, that, and that's consistent with the empirical data that, that's been recently collected. Um, all right. So, um, to summarize so far, 
I've shown you some evidence from a bunch of different sources that people learn to infer. They, their, their judgments adapt to the query distribution, and, and this might um, offer an explanation of different contradictory patterns of uh, under and overreaction that are documented in the experimental literature. Um, and it seems seductive to think that this might be an account of how the, the brain might do approximate inference, that there's a single network that's outputting posteriors directly rather than running inference from scratch. Um, and there's an interesting connection here to um, uh, deep networks, and I think this comes back to a question that came up in the previous uh, part of the tutorial. Um, so can we connect this in any plausible way to the kinds of um, deep learning architectures that have been applied to um, um, systems neuroscience? And uh, I'll give you one answer to that question. So let's take, for example, this very successful model from Dan Yamins and Jim DiCarlo, um, where they model the ventral visual stream as this feed-forward neural network. Well, now, now they've added some bells and whistles and there's recurrence and feedback, but, but this is kind of the, the, the initial version of this was feed-forward, um, a feed-forward convolutional neural network. Um, so one way we might think about what's going on here is that this feed-forward network is actually the approximate recognition model, you know, approximate amortized posterior for a structured generative model. And this is the, this is the line of argument that was made um, by Ilko Yildirim. Um, so he developed this uh, structure generative model for faces that, that has um, a bunch of uh, pose parameters like, um, sorry, shape parameters like, like sh uh, shape and, and also texture, and then some uh, pose and lighting parameters, and these are all entered into an, a rendering, uh, a graphics renderer to produce some realistic three-dimensional face. Um, and then he modeled the inference about uh, these parameters as uh, using this amortized neural network that basically tries to map from the data back into the latent space of the structure generative model. And, and by training these things conjointly, you can synthesize the combination of kind of structured generative models, which allow you to make, um, to, to have sort of strong inductive biases about the nature of those parameters, but the efficiency of, um, of deep neural networks. Um, so that you don't have to run some very costly inference algorithm. And they did a bunch of exper uh, experiments on how people actually uh, make inferences about things like lighting and pose, and they showed that the, um, if you try to train a, a convolutional neural network by itself on this task, it doesn't do very well. Um, but you can do much better if you, you take this, um, if you use the convolutional neural network as the, the um, recognition model for a structured generative model. And by well, I mean that, that uh, you know, it matches people's human behavior much better. Um, uh, and in fact, they went one step further and they connected uh, the, the representations from this uh, convolutional neural network to, um, uh, uh, to macaque face patch responses and, and tried to argue that the similarity, that the, um, the similarity structure of these macaque face patch responses matches this, the particular similarity structure of this um, recognition model, this ConvNet that's trained as a recognition model. Um, they actually have a, I, I discovered that they have a more recent uh, preprint based on this uh, that you can see on BioArchive, which I haven't read yet, but I'm sure it's great. All right, so let's go to the, the last part of the tutorial. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, which is, are we making things too complicated? So we've, we've gone through a lot of technical stuff, variational inference, markup chains, uh, you know, amortized posteriors and so on. Um, that's a lot of work, right, to, to, make, to set these things up so that they work properly. Um, maybe we're making things too complicated. Um, maybe there's a way to do this with a lot less work. Um, so this leads to this comparison between bespoke versus, um, versus generic neural networks. Um, so we, one nice thing about bespoke neural networks that are designed for this very particular purpose is that we can guarantee that they're doing the right thing under certain circumstances. Um, but how far can we go with generic, non-specialized neural networks that weren't optimized for this purpose? So this was um, um, a question that was answered by uh, Ermin Orhan and Weiji Ma um, in this very interesting paper where they took uh, generic neural networks, um, the, just simple feed-forward networks that. And the only thing bespoke about these networks is that they were configured to solve particular tasks like queue combination. Um, but beyond that, they weren't specifically designed to solve probabilistic inference problems. Um, and, and the only thing that they, they the added thing that they did here was that they assumed that um, 
um, like in the po probabilistic population coding models, that the gain of the responses at the input layer depended on uh, uncertainty, so on, on, on contrast um, for some of these tasks. Um, so, so then they basically just train these networks without optimizing for probabilistic inference. They're just trained to solve this particular task. Um, and they did this for a bunch of different tasks like hue combination, um, uh, coordinate transformations, common filtering, causal structure inference. Um, and then what they showed rather remarkably is that um, the estimates of the variables that they got um, for continuous tasks um, were very close to the, um, the estimates that you get from the Bayes optimal solution. Um, and on discrete tasks, you could even, they even show that the posterior probability, the, the, the probabilistic output from, of the network, so that network can give a probabilistic output, but it's not actually computing a, a posterior, uh, at least not by design, uh, was very close to, to the, tr the true posterior probability. Um, uh, th and they, they took this one step further, and they, they showed that um, if, you take a, if you train a queue combination network with two queues, and then you hold those, you basically freeze those the weights for that, those, that part of the network, and then you add a third queue, then the frozen part of the network can combine with this new queue, once it's properly trained, um, to do three queue, uh, queue combination near optimally. Uh, so what that means is that in order to do that near optimally, you have to have, it, it implies that they, the, these, the, the pre-trained modules have represented something about the uncertainty um, that they can then transfer to this 3Q case. Um, so it's a pretty non-trivial generalization um, uh, from this training regime. Um, uh, so, so it's pretty interesting, I think, that, to, to find that you can get kind of um, probabilistic inference behavior out of non-probabilistically trained networks. Uh, and they, they make an efficiency argument here, which is um, that uh, you need many fewer neurons um, to achieve near optimal performance uh, compared to what you might need, for example, in a probabilistic population code. So it actually, um, the minimum number of hidden units you need grows sublinearly with the number of input units, which, again, suggests a kind of tractability argument in favor of this kind of um, objective function. Um, there's another way to, to construct probabilistic inference from ostensibly non-probabilistic machinery uh, by introducing a reliability cost. So this is work by Lawrence Aitchison and, and Mate Lengel. Um, so, so the idea here is that you're going to take a generic neural network that's trained non-probabilistically, or rather, it, it's not trained to output a, a posterior probability, but it, it, but it has a, um, a it, it's trained to optimize, um, or I'll show you what the optimization problem is in a second, but I just say one more thing about the reliability cost, which is that the, the you know, this kind of reliability cost is plausible because um, we know that signaling mechanisms like uh, ion channels and quantal release are intrinsically stochastic and that a big part of our brain's energy budget is basically devoted to um, you know, controlling the reliability of this, um, of this stochastic machinery. So the objective function that they introduced here is a, a coding cost for encoding some latent variable z um, that depends on the reconstruction error um, and, and the sparseness cost. Um, so this is basically like a standard optimization problem for a latent variable model, um, like sparse coding model. But then they also, they, so, so then the idea here is that they combine that coding cost with a reliability cost. And, the, and um, the simplest thing to do analytically is to use the entropy, because if you use the entropy, then the expected coding cost plus the, uh, minus the entropy gives you the variational free energy. Um, so, so what we've done here is shown how if you, if you construct a network that's just trying to optimize reconstruction, uh, reconstruction error plus a sparsity penalty plus a reliability cost, then an emergent property of that optimization problem is that they will actually be solving, in effect, a variational optimization problem, that they will, in effect, be optimizing a variational posterior. So, so it's important to keep in mind that the stochasticity of the network is not... Um, designed to sample from the posterior. Rather, the stochasticity is just there, but by training the network to optimize this objective function, you can basically harness that stochasticity to generate samples from, the, from this approximate posterior. So that's another way to get um, um, approximate inference out of machinery that was not, um, 
that, that was not specialized for approximate inference. Um, so what are the implications of this? Um, so we see that probabilistic inference emerges from networks that are optimized to find good codes uh, while paying a cost on reliability. And, and, and there's, this means that there's an interesting synergy between biophysical and statistical constraints. So you might motivate a reliability cost purely on biophysical grounds that is energetically costly to be reliable, but that turns out to have this other asset from a statistical perspective that you can approximate the posterior that way. Um, and there's an interesting um, connection here between sampling and variational inference. So now we have these stochastic networks that are stochastic by virtue of their signaling machinery, but they can be harnessed to optimize free energy. Um, all right, so, so I'm gonna wrap up and then I hope that we can just have some, some open discussion. Um, so I hope to convey that approximate inference in the brain is inevitable in the sense that there's no other way to do inference except approximately, but it's also still shrouded in mystery. And we have these main candidates like Monte Carlo methods and variational methods, uh, um, but really each one of those is kind of this box filled with uh, lots of different options for uh, how to construct approximations. Um, and, and in some cases, these things might t tend to converge, like we can build sample-based variational approximations. Um, so it might turn out to be the case that the, the approximation algorithm or algorithms that are used by the brain are using all of these things simultaneously in some interesting way. Um, and, and finally, um, I think that the, the question of amortization opens up a whole host of interesting issues for neural computation. Um, this idea that the brain's inference engine is optimized for not just a single posterior, but for a whole ensemble of posteriors. And I think that's deserving of, of uh, significant future work. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this, I, I just threw up a few references here, um, and I'm sure there's more recent ones as well. Um, and yeah, I'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah. Unless everyone's totally exhausted, yeah. Yeah, so that, yes, sort of. I mean, but I'm not sure how scalable. Yes, there, there is like, for example, some people in machine learning have developed uh, amortized sequential Monte Carlo methods. Yeah. Oftentimes they, they use some kind of deep network to parameterize the sampling distribution, for example. Yeah, no, 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 I think that that is something of the sort that people have tried. Other questions? Yeah. 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 So the question is, how do you learn the generative models themselves? Yeah, that's a huge question. I mean, a lot of people have thought about that, and I, I sort of avoided that here. Um, but I mean, I'd suggest, for example, looking at work from Wolfgang Moss's lab, who's done a lot of work on, um, on, on learning of generative models. Yeah. Anything else? All right, well, thank you guys for listening. This was fun. Yeah.